Ugh, okay, I'm straight up out of ideas on how to write intros for these Steven Universe videos. You know I love the show, you know it's my favorite, you know I talk about it constantly, and you know I've recapped the entire plot of all six seasons plus the movie in two big recap videos. But what if two videos became one videos? Yeah, that's all I got. Basically, I felt weird about my two Steven Universe recaps being split up into separate videos, so now they're fused together into one ultimate Steven Universe recap video. I don't know. Don't worry, I'll be back soon with an actual new video that you guys have been asking for. I just need a little bit more time to work on it. But for now, here is the actual complete entirety of Steven Universe. Oh boy. Okay, so to start, Steven Universe is a Cartoon Network show about a kid named Steven who's a member of this group called the Crystal Gems. Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl! Garnet's chill, Amethyst's kinda punky, and Pearl looks like a bird. The gems are a race of, like, alien beings that are basically just rocks with brains that project physical forms. So like, their bodies aren't real, but they are. Like, they can still get hurt and stuff. I don't know, but basically, Steven's a gem too. Mostly. He's the child of Rose Quartz, the former leader of the Crystal Gems, and Greg Universe, just some dude. So he's part gem and part human. Rose actually had to give up her physical form in order for Steven to exist, so she's pretty much dead, and Steven's got her gem. The gems all live in a town called Beach City and go on adventures fighting monsters and stuff. But Steven's gotta stay home because he doesn't know how to work his gem powers yet. Most early episodes center around explaining different aspects of the gem race and showing Steven learn how to use his gem powers. Steven eventually gets to go on missions, he learns he can shapeshift, he gets a magic pink lion, he meets a girl named Connie, he finds out he has healing powers, he learns that gems can fuse together, he finds this magic mirror that turns out to be another gem called Lapis Lazuli, that one's important, and he almost freaking dies of old age in a shockingly real scene that disturbed the heck out of me the first time I saw it. Oh, and he can summon his mom's shield. That's important, I guess. But even with all that, the real main plot of this season involves the gems warping around the earth and fighting these monsters that are actually other gems that have been corrupted. So now they're scary monsters. But even scary monsters have feelings. But how did all these gems get on Earth in the first place? Well, remember how I said gems are aliens? They come from this planet called Homeworld, which is run by four ultra-powerful gems called diamonds, yellow, blue, white, and pink. They're mostly just taller than everyone else. And they invaded Earth, tried to destroy all of its organic life, and turned the whole planet into a place to grow more gems. But the crystal gems rebelled against Homeworld, a freaking war broke out, and a ton of gems were shattered. Or, you know, Killed. But the Crystal Gems somehow managed to save the Earth from being colonized, so things were mostly chill. But then, thousands of years later, some suspicious stuff starts going down. Steven discovers that a new gem with these robot limbs named Peridot is checking up on the planet and repairing various warp stations that lead back to Homeworld. This is a pretty obvious problem for a bunch of war criminals hiding out on Earth. So the gems destroy the warp pad, obviously. But that only causes more problems as Peridot Peridot brings a whole freaking ship to Earth with Lapis, that mirror gem, and this big freaking scary gem, Jasper. Uh, Jasper thinks Steven is Rose Quartz, so she kidnaps everyone and starts flying them back to Homeworld. And this is where we find out the first big twist of the series. Ruby and Sapphire. On Jasper's ship, Steven finds two more imprisoned gems, Ruby and Sapphire, who are actually Garnet. Yes, this entire time, Garnet's been a fusion. Ruby and Sapphire reunite to form Garnet. Jasper gets all, ugh, fusions for poo-poo butt gems who are weak. But then Garnet's just like, I'm gonna rap now. She kicks Jasper's butt, the ship crash lands back on Earth, and it all culminates with one last face-off on the beach. In a moment of desperation, Jasper fuses with Lapis, forming a new gem called Malachite. But Lapis manages to control the fusion enough to retreat into the ocean and stop anyone from being hurt. And yeah, it's pretty intense. How'd this season start again? Uh, I just turned all my fingers into cats! So yeah, things got real by the end of season one. And with Jasper out of the picture for now, season two is mostly about finding Peridot and dealing with these creepy new gem monsters made out of fused pieces of shattered gems. They're like reanimated mutant zombie Frankenstein monsters, and it's 
Yeah, it's kind of disturbing, actually. Meanwhile, Pearl is teaching Steven's friend Connie to sword fight. Yay! Which comes in handy when the mutated gem experiments start showing up in town. Oh no! That could cause such an imminent threat to all the innocent people. I'm sure they're going to warn all the citizens and- <gasps> Peridot! Oh my gosh, get her! Kill it! Yeah, next episode, Perry's back. And the whole gem mutants reaching Beach City thing is just kind of abandoned. I'm sure they'll be fine. The gems finally manage to capture Peridot, and she tells them about this thing called the Cluster, which is an enormous bioweapon built out of a ton of those gem fusion experiments that have been buried in the Earth's crust. It's been building and building over thousands of years, and once it takes form, it would totally destroy the planet. Wow. That's a pretty huge threat. They should probably warn everyone and maybe bring in the military. Or they decide to build a drill to dig to the center of the earth completely on their own using spare parts they found in a barn. Yep, <sighs> great, sure. Makes total sense, whatever. And the rest of the season is just the five of them working on this drill as Peridot learns more about the Earth and eventually becomes a crystal gem herself. Redemption, woo! Honestly though, when I first started watching Steven Universe, the whole Peridot becomes a crystal gem arc was basically what made me officially fall in love with the series. It's just too wholesome. But anyway, now on to season three and everything is going wrong. Malachite's back and the cluster is forming both at the same time. So the gang has to split up with Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl fighting Malachite, leaving Steven and Peridot to deal with the cluster completely on their own. Malachite gets her butt whipped and the gem save Lapis from Jasper, which is good. But surprise, surprise, the drill sucks at destroying the cluster and Steven and Perry might die, which is bad. But then Steven somehow manages to communicate with the cluster. The cluster just wants to form, but Steven's like, but you have each other. And that works. Apparently. Steven, with the help of all the gem shards in the cluster, manages to place the whole thing in a stasis bubble. So like, it's dormant again, but it's still there. Eh, good enough for me. And after that action-packed premiere, the rest of the season just kind of kicks around for a while. The main thing going on is the hunt for Jasper. But in the meantime, Steven finds another new gem, a former member of the Crystal Gems named Bismuth. She gets along with everyone really well, but has to be poofed again because she wanted to create this intense weapon to shatter gems. Basically, she wanted to go on a killing spree, so... Bye bye, Bismuth. Right after that, <gasps> Jasper's back, get her, kill it! Steven, Peridot, and Amethyst find Jasper building an army of corrupted gems. Amethyst tries to fight her off on her own, but gets her butt kicked. So Steven tries to help her out and they accidentally end up fusing together. This is the first time Steven fuses with any of the main crystal gems and it is so hype! But uh, things get mega heavy again right after as Jasper attempts to fuse with a corrupted gem, gets corrupted herself, and lets on about something horrible Rose did to Pink Diamond before going full monster and getting poofed by Peridot. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that was a lot. And what was Jasper saying about Pink Diamond? Well, one thing I haven't mentioned is that a Pink Diamond is dead, shattered by Rose Quartz. Yeah, so Steven's mom is a shatterer, and that's a pretty intense thing for a kid to go through. So naturally, in a show like Steven Universe that's all about being connected with your feelings, it's time for a wacky Roadrunner parody with Peridot. Yeah, we're entering season four now, and Steven Universe kinda has this habit of doing a lot of filler episodes right after things get interesting. So we just kind of do that for a while until eventually we meet two new mysterious gems, Topaz and Aquamarine, who were sent by the diamonds to kidnap Steven's friends. Steven manages to save them by giving himself over, claiming to be Rose Quartz, and the spaceship sets off for Homeworld. So now it's just Topaz, Aquamarine, Steven, and Lars. Ugh. Right? Haven't mentioned him yet. So, this is Lars. He's a human who works at a donut shop in Beach City, and for the majority of the show, he is the worst. He's always a jerk, he learns no lessons, and he is frustrating beyond belief to watch. He's the worst, and I hate him. Except, 
You're, well, we'll get to that. Steven and Lars are taken to Homeworld, and Steven is put on trial for the shattering of Pink Diamond. But Steven's lawyer realizes that there are a ton of holes in the story. Like, how could anyone get that close to a diamond and no one notice or try to stop it? It doesn't make sense. Yellow gets totally fed up with all of this and starts raging, giving Steven and Lars time to escape. They crash land in a dark corner of Homeworld and meet a group of unusual gems called the Off Colors. They're all different in some way, so they hide or else they'll be destroyed by these scanner droids that explode any gem they find. But Lars doesn't have a gem, so he's basically invisible. And once an attack starts, Lars decides to finally stand up and fight, saving everyone. But then, Lars dies. But then he doesn't. Steven starts crying, and his tears bring Lars back to life. Remember I said he has healing powers? And now Lars is all pink, and his hair works like a portal that connects to Steven's lion, who also has portal hair. Don't question it, we're almost done. So Lars is back after being dead for five seconds, and now he's a good person. It took four seasons and the end of his life to do it, but Lars doesn't suck anymore. He and the off-colors escape Homeworld and start traveling space Star Trek style while Steven escapes back to Beach City through Lars's hair. It's more normal than it sounds, I promise. Fast forward a bit and Steven has a strange dream about Pink Diamond where he sees Pearl sneak up behind her and draw a sword. And uh, Steven's dreams are usually astral projections, so... That's concerning. He confronts Pearl about what he saw, and we get the biggest reveal of the entire series. Rose Quartz, Steven's mom, was Pink Diamond. Okay. What? 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 So Pink was actually the one who wanted to rebel against the diamonds, save Earth, and start a new life. So she created a new identity and killed off Pink by having Pearl take Rose's form and pretend to shatter her. And because Pink was Rose and Rose's gem is now in Steven, that means Steven is Pink Diamond. Again, what? And with that news finally out in the open, everything starts happening at once. The diamonds come to Earth to attack, the cluster comes back out of nowhere and forms a giant arm like the diamond ships, but is apparently fighting on the crystal gem side. That's pretty weird. Oh, and Bismuth is back. You know, the gem that wanted to shatter a bunch of people and even tried to shatter Steven. Yeah, everyone's just cool with her now. Ah, uh, being cool with attempted murderers is tight. Anyway, they all fight the diamonds until Steven, through some weird psychic stuff that's never really explained is finally able to convince Blue and Yellow Diamond that he really is pink and stop the fighting. So Blue and Yellow aren't threats anymore. Not really. But we're not done yet. Steven wants the diamonds to help him cure all the corrupted gems. But even with the three of them, they just can't do it. They need someone else. White Diamond. And up to this point in the show, we've barely even heard about White, let alone seen her. So the whole crew are now off to Homeworld one last time to talk to White Diamond. To make a long story short, it went poo poo. A lot happens during this arc, but the basics are White attacks everyone and things get <laughs> really cool. Every crystal gem is fighting off White's giant robot and we even get to see a ton of new fusions. But White overpowers them and zaps the diamonds and the gems, putting them under her control. Poo -poo. She grabs Steven and forcibly rips out his gem because she thinks it'll release Pink's original form. Instead, it releases this super powerful, otherworldly Pink version of Steven, which I guess is supposed to be like Steven's gem half or something. Meanwhile, Steven's gemless human half is left weak and powerless. And White's all like, where's Pink? But Gem Steven's just like, she's. And then the two Stevens walk up to each other, laugh, cry, hug each other a lot, and then they fuse together, it's animated really well, and Steven is back! What even just happened? And in that moment, well on Homeworld they say, that White Diamond's heart grew three sizes that day. Seriously, White starts glowing pink, meaning she's now off color. She's not perfect like she wanted to be, but that's okay. And Steven's like, that's kinda what we've been saying for five seasons. And just like before, White's no longer a threat. The gems and the diamonds all go back to Earth and cure all of the corrupted gems, even Jasper. Oh, and Lars and the off colors make it back to Earth too. All the gems are safe, the diamonds learn the error of their ways, and everyone lived happily ever after. And that 
is the complete story of Steven Universe from beginning to end. This is legit my favorite cartoon ever, and I am so happy that it was given such a proper and satisfying ending. Wait. When we last left Steven and the gang, they had just made peace with Yellow, Blue, and White Diamond after going through the whole complicated rigmarole of Steven also being Rose Quartz, who was also Pink Diamond. They all came back to Earth to heal the corrupted gems, including Jasper, that one's important, and they all lived happily ever after. And I said all that at the end of my last recap. I didn't know that was gonna be the theme of the movie. <laughs> These days, the gems are living out their happily ever after by building a little place in the middle of Beach City for the now healed corrupted gems to live out their lives and learn about all the crap they missed. It's called Little Homeworld, and everyone is doing great. Though the diamonds keep badgering Steven, the closest thing to Pink Diamond they have left, to move in with them on Big Homeworld. Obviously, Steven does not want to do that, but I'm sure that'll sort itself out eventually. But for now, we get to see our favorite main character gems finally able to relax after all these years. No more villains, no more wars, everyone can just chill. Okay. Giant drill full of pink goo just landed on the earth. There's some weird new gem standing on top of it. This is Spinel. Yeah! <laughs> Calm down. Spinel is a very angry gem who we know nothing about. Steven's like, hi, I'm Steven. What's your name? Whoa! Whoa! Her giant drill digs into the ground and she immediately starts swinging at Steven and the gems with this crazy scythe thing called a rejuvenator. And Pearl's all like, I cannot believe it is you, Spinel, who for the audience's information was... The gems are all poofed by Spinel's rejuvenator. Steven gets hit with it too, but it just kind of gives him the jibblies for a bit, so he yoinks the scythe away from Spinel and poofs her with it. A reminder, poofing is not killing. Poofing is simply dissipating their physical form for a little while. Shattering is killing, but you know, that's not important right now. Eventually, all the gems start reforming, but they're acting odd. It's like they all reset to their factory defaults or something. Oh, that's why they call it a rejuvenator. All right, that checks out. And before Steven can even hope to make sense of what's going on, Spinel comes back. But she's not the same angry, vengeful, spiky-haired gem we knew before. Now she's all happy, bubbly, and calls Steven her best friend. First she tries to kill him, now she's his best friend. I'd make a joke about that, but that's kind of just how Steven makes friends. And to make matters worse, the rejuvenator might not have poofed Steven, but now his powers aren't working. Man, how could this possibly get any worse? Oh crap, the drill. This giant syringe is injecting some kind of pink toxin into the world that's killing everything. So we're gonna have to deal with that at some point. But first, we gotta get the crystal gems back to normal. Several musical numbers later, Amethyst is back to normal, Ruby and Sapphire formed Garnet, but she doesn't really have her memories back, and Steven got Pearl back to normal by fusing with his dad, because that's apparently just something he can do now. But that also triggered something in Spinel that made her run away. Steven finds her at a warp pad, and they try travel to this abandoned space garden. Apparently, this is where Spinel used to live as a playmate for Pink Diamond way back in the day. But once Pink was given her first colony, the Earth, she legit just abandoned Spinel, told her to stand perfectly still and wait for her as part of a game, and then just dipped, confirming my theory that Pink has been the real villain of this entire series. Holy crap, what a terrible person. Spinel waited in that garden for six thousand years, never moving an inch. But after all the diamond drama went down and peace was restored, Steven sent out a message to the universe and Spinel learned the truth. Pink left her, started a new life, made new friends, and then disappeared forever. That's why Spinel randomly attacked the Earth. Revenge. Doesn't really explain where she got the injector though, but... Uh, Steven does what he does best and promises to help her if she helps him save the Earth. But Spinel starts questioning if he really wants to be her friend or if he's just lying to her like Pink so she'll turn off the injector. And when Steven accidentally drops the rejuvenator, Spinel's just like, oh no, nah, -uh, you ain't pulling a fast one on me. I don't know why Spinel sounds like John Mulaney, but all right. She turns on Steven and drills the injector back into the Earth. Oh, uh, Garnet got her memories back, by the way. It leads to a cool musical number. Number, but ultimately in the plot, it just kind of happens. And now we have the final face-off between Steven and Spinel. Steven randomly gets his powers back through an anime-style epiphany like, oh, I just need to believe in my ability to change. And he launches into an epic musical number. But Spinel isn't having any of that and says, Just can it, won't ya? You can't just make everything better by singing some stupid song. 
wrong. Which has weird implications. So apparently, in universe, Steven is literally singing a completely original song that he's just pulled out of his butt while being mercilessly beaten up by Spinel. That just seems like a weird use of time right now. But I guess it does something because eventually Spinel comes to a realization that Steven really was trying to help her. And she breaks down, wondering why she's even fighting. She starts crying and then I start crying and then everyone's crying and <laughs> But right as they stop fighting, the injector just goes Steven manages to save himself and Spinel from, you know, exploding and dying, but the town's still in pretty bad shape. Spinel's like, well, I've made a mess. I should probably be on my way out. She feels like she's already screwed up too much to be friends with Steven and wishes she could have a blank slate with someone else. Here come the diamonds! Yeah! Blue, yellow, and white all come down to Earth at the worst possible time to be closer to Steven. But once they meet Spinel and hear about her story, they're like, Yeah, dude, Earth sucks, but low key, this pink gem's pretty dope. Is it chill if we like take her? Spinel's like, that'd be chill. They all leap for Homeworld and Steven starts licking the dirt. Steven Universe future. And this is where things start getting pretty crazy. By the way, if you're enjoying this recap so far, you can always head down below this video and click the subscribe button and hit the little notification bell next to it to make sure you don't miss any future recaps like this. I'd really appreciate the support. So what's going on now? Sometime after the events of the movie, the world is back to normal and the gems have created little homeschool to better teach the healed gems about their new life on Earth. Steven's kind of like the principal of the school, but he's clear clearly struggling. He's loaded down with responsibilities, he's dealing with gems who still hate him, and a bunch of his friends are starting to change or leave Beach City. And all this change and stress is causing some weird things to happen to Steven. Remember at the end of my last recap when White Diamond ripped Steven's gem out of him and it created this pink glowy Steven that was insanely strong and super scary? Well now, anytime Steven gets too worked up, too scared, too stressed, he starts glowing pink and gets all sorts of new powers. This is Steven's diamond half starting to shine through. He discovers this for the first time during a fight with Jasper in episode one and is like, wow, okay. That's weird. Jasper, you know anything about this? But Jasper's just like, get off my property. So over the next like five, six, seven episodes, this kind of crap just keeps happening and no one really does anything about it. But after one particular incident that nearly kills Steven and his friends at a little homeschool graduation, Steven decides the stress is becoming too much for him and he quits his job at little homeschool. But honestly, I think this just made everything worse. See, Steven has spent pretty much his whole life doing two things, helping others and avoiding death. People really like trying to kill this boy. But now, no one's really trying to kill him anymore and all the people he was trying to help are better now. So Steven's kind of left feeling like he has no purpose. And when you're feeling lost, you can make very, very stupid decisions. And this is where Connie comes back into the picture. These days, it's kind of implied that Steven and Connie are maybe dating now, but they don't get to see each other a ton because Connie is super busy studying to lo-fi chill hip hop beats. Uh, she's getting ready to enroll in an out of state college and Steven's getting worried that the two of them will start to drift apart. Oh, uh, that reminds me, I kind of forgot to mention in my last recap that Steven and Connie can fuse together to form Stevani. Stevani is definitely one of the most interesting characters in this show, but they don't show up super often, so unfortunately, they got a little lost in the shuffle last time. But as Steven's going through it, he realizes that when he's part of Stevani, he doesn't feel lost, which makes him even more worried about Connie moving away. And here's where the stupid comes in. Steven decides that at the age of 16 and right before Connie's about to start college to propose to her in the hopes of getting married and going to college with her. This goes about as well as you'd expect. Steven is, of course, rejected in honestly a really polite and loving way. Connie doesn't say, no way, freak, and then spit in his face or anything. She gives him a hug and says, it's not a no, it's a not now. And Steven takes it pretty well until he doesn't. And this is where things get 
pretty serious. Steven starts glowing again, but now he's also starting to swell up uncontrollably. He goes to the hospital and discovers that while he's healed physically from all of his dangerous adventures over the years, he never really healed mentally. Steven's been dealing with near-death experiences since he was a little kid, always in danger, someone always trying to kill him. And that childhood trauma is affecting the way his body handles stress. Every problem in Steven's life feels like the end of the world because that's all he's known. In the show's own words, his body is responding to minor threats as if his life were in danger. And with all this change in his life and his fears of being left behind looming over him constantly, his body's response to that stress is becoming more and more extreme. Unfortunately, things for Steven don't get much better after the hospital visit. He's still swelling, he still can't control his diamond powers, and he doesn't know what to do or how to keep his friends out of danger. So he runs away and finds Jasper to ask for help. Jasper Jasper convinces Steven that instead of trying to repress his anger and his powers, he should just let them out. So the two begin training, and as Steven learns more and more about his powers, he becomes not himself. Eventually, new buff Steven decides he's ready for a rematch against Jasper. But during their fight, he loses control again. He traps Jasper and attacks her with a giant wall of spikes, and Steven shattered her. Jasper's dead. Uh, luckily, he's able to heal Jasper's gem and bring her back, but holy crap, I never would have dreamed this show would go there. This is still the cheeseburger backpack show. The show that started with a rap about cat-shaped ice cream sandwiches. And the main character just killed someone! The newly healed Jasper bows to Steven and calls him her diamond, which really freaks Steven out, as if he weren't already freaking out enough. You know from the manslaughter. Steven runs away to Homeworld to talk to the diamonds, but that doesn't really help. Though, for some levity, we do get to see Spinel again, which is nice. She seems to be doing well. She's animated like Sonic now for some reason, which I guess is a sign of growth. I'm glad she's doing better. Can we just focus on her for a bit? Cause Steven's starting to fantasize about shattering White Diamond and I'm very scared. Steven's friends give him an intervention where he breaks down and admits to all the dark thoughts he's had and to shattering Jasper. He calls himself a fraud and a monster and suddenly his body just erupts, growing into an actual giant monster. So that's a thing we have to deal with now, but the gems don't really know what to do. He's too powerful to attack, too strong to restrain for long, and he won't listen to anyone. Lapis holds him back for a while, but he breaks free just in time for, of course, the cluster to come back, because the cluster will always come back, and for the diamonds to show up at the worst possible time, because the diamonds will always show up at the worst possible time. They start crying and blaming themselves as the cluster holds back Steve even, but Connie's just like, yes, this is your fault, but now's not the time for pity parties, you narcissists. Connie realizes that for his entire life, Steven's been helping everyone with their problems and making them better people. But Steven never had that for himself. So in the most Steven universe move ever, instead of fighting the gems, the diamonds, Greg, Connie, Lion, the cluster, they all tackle hug Steven. Even after he confessed to all the awful stuff he's bottled up, his friends and family are still there to show him love and support through everything he's going through. Steven finally stops, breaks into tears, and shrinks back down to his normal self. Whoo! Okay! Oh my god! Cookie Cat! He's a pet for your tummy! Cookie Cat! Woo! Okay! Happy times! Good time show! Happy time, fun time, Steven! Woo! <laughs> Several months later, Steven is doing a lot better. He's keeping up with his friends, he's finally seeing a therapist, Steven X Therapy confirmed, and he's decided it's time for him to move out. He goes around town, says his goodbyes, drives away, and with that, Steven Universe is officially over. And wow, what a freaking journey this show has been. I don't think I've ever seen a show grow, change, and defy expectations as much as Steven Universe. And the way they managed to totally flip the show on its head in this last season was absolutely incredible. Like, for real, anyone who worked on this series should feel so proud of what they created. Steven Universe is over, but it's never gonna be forgotten. Mainly because I'm going to have nightmares about buff murder Steven for the rest of my freaking life. Jesus Christ.
Things used to be way simpler, man. When I was a kid, my favorite cartoons didn't have stories. They were goofy comedies where literally anything could happen to the characters and it would all reset back to normal by the next episode. You could straight up explode a man and he'd be back next week and no one would ever talk about it again. But these days, all these cartoons I'm watching have plots and arcs and it's exhausting, man. Why do I spend so much of my time crying at drawings? And one of the biggest offenders of this is Disney's Gravity Falls. And that's because it's like, the best cartoon ever made? Not necessarily my favorite, but one of the most perfectly made cartoon stories I've ever seen. The story this show fits into just 40 episodes blows my mind, and I really just want to talk to someone about it. So just like I did with Steven Universe, today I want to bring you guys the entire story of Gravity Falls. Asterisk, uh, it's going to be very simplified because this video can't be 45 minutes. But before we get started, if you like what I'm doing on this channel and want to see more, then be sure to head Head down, hit that subscribe button, and ring the ding dang notification bell or whatever to make sure you never miss a new video. And while you're down there, if you look just below the subscribe button, you'll find my YouTube merch shelf where you can pick up some cool Foot of a Ferret t-shirts. My personal favorite is the Brief History logo tee, and you can tell it's my favorite because I wear it in every freaking video I make. So if you want to support the channel, subscribing, turning on notifications, and checking out the merch are all great ways to do it, and I really appreciate it. And with all that said, this is Gravity Falls, the whole story, or whatever I decide to call this video. So, here we go. Gravity Falls is the story of Mabel and Dipper Pines, a pair of twins spending their summer vacation in Gravity Falls, Oregon. Dipper is a nerdy dork geek 12 year old with the voice of a 30 year old man who likes mysteries, conspiracies, and probably watches a lot of Shane Dawson. Mabel is a super cheery 12 year old girl who loves unicorns, rainbows, and probably also watches a lot of Shane Dawson. They live with their sketchy great uncle Stanford Pines who runs a crappy tourist trap in town called the Mystery Shack. Also working at the Mystery Shack is a teenage girl named Wendy and a Seuss named Seuss. The town of Gravity Falls is full of crazy supernatural stuff, like ghosts, minotaurs, mermaids, Wax Larry King, and a lot more. Dipper starts picking up on all these weird happenings and asks Runkle Stan about it, but he's like, <laughs> Leave. So while wandering the woods alone, Dipper discovers a secret compartment in a tree that opens up a hatch in the ground. This, this seems safe. He looks inside the secret grass hatch and finds a dusty, musty book with a giant six-fingered hand and the number three on it. I see absolutely nothing unusual about this whatsoever. Inside the book are journal entries from an anonymous author detailing tons of the weird things going on in Gravity Falls. And this journal comes in handy as tons of crazy things start happening to the pines. Like, a lot of stuff, man. It's like they built their house on a weirdness magnet or something. For a lot of season one, the show takes on a monster of the week kind of thing. But there is this underlying mystery from episode one. At the end of that episode, we see Stan sneaking through the shack at night. He enters a code on a vending machine that opens up a secret doorway. Ooh. But the plot doesn't really pick back up until we meet Gideon. Gideon is a tiny, small little boy who runs his own tourist trap somehow. He's a local celebrity and he has an amulet that gives him psychic powers. Again, somehow. One day, Dipper, Mabel, and Seuss go to see Gideon's show to scope out the competition and Gideon falls in love with Mabel in a matter of like seconds. But Mabel's like, I have a crush on every boy, but not not you. Mabel sends Dipper to friend zone Gideon, but Gideon's just like, we live in a society, and attacks Dipper with his powers. Mabel shuts that mess down, smashes the amulet, and cuts ties with the toxic marshmallow man. And because Gideon is just so mentally stable, he swears vengeance on the entire Pines family by scheming to steal the mystery shack. And then we find out that <gasps> Gideon has a journal just like Dipper's, but this one has a two on it. That's one less than three! And the plot thickens! <laughs> Some not much happens for a while, and then Gideon returns. This time around, he wants to steal the deed to the mystery shack from Grunkle Stan's safe in the most extra way possible. So he summons this little triangle dude in a bow tie and tall hat named Bill Cipher. You see, Bill's a demon, an ancient interdimensional demon who can enter people's minds. Bill seems to have some kind of history with the pines, but we'll go into that later. Right now, Bill hops into Stan's mind to look for the combination to his safe, but Dipper, Mabel, and Seuss chase after him. To make a long story short, the gang stops Bill from getting the combination, Gideon calls off the deal, and he just blows up the safe 
safe while everyone's busy running around in Stan's head. Yeah, they didn't really think about that part, did they? So, Gideon has the deed now. That's a big deal. He plans to tear down the mystery shack to build Meta Commentary. But it goes deeper than that. See, Gideon's searching for the other journal. He's got number two, he wants number one, and he doesn't actually know that a third one exists. But he does know that once all the journals are together, they can unlock ultimate power or something. We, we don't actually know yet. And he suspects the other journal is somewhere around the mystery shack. Dipper and Mabel tried to stop him, but it only made things worse as as Gideon steals Dipper's journal. Plus, with no shack and no job, Stan can't take care of the twins anymore, so they hop on a bus to head back home. But once Gideon realizes he got journal three and not journal one, he assumes Dipper swindled him and is running off with the last journal for himself. Dipper doesn't even know there is more than one journal. So obviously, the only logical thing to do is giant robot. Yeah, he hops in a giant robot Gideon and chases after the twins bus. This kid's got no chance. Chill, man. He catches Dipper and Mabel. Oh no! But then Dipper bursts into the cockpit of the robot and starts beating up Gideon. Woo! Fighting is cool! But then the robot falls yeah. off a bridge and they all plummet to their doom. Woo! Children dying is cool! <laughs> But then Mabel pulls out a grappling hook that she got in episode one and hasn't appeared again at all until the season finale, and she saves Dipper and herself from dying from both a terrible fall and a giant explosion. Oh, that's cool, I guess. Sorry I wasn't paying attention. But Gideon knows the town loves him, so he starts to pull a fast one once the cops show up. I know you just saw me attack two children with a giant robot, but actually, they're the bad guys. Arrest them now with no evidence necessary. That sounds more like the grandma from Big City Greens, but uh, who can do Thurup Van Orman's voice? Who? But the cops are like, we're totally inept at our job, so okay. But then Stan shows up and proves to everyone that Gideon's a fraud and a creep because he was using hidden cameras to spy on everyone in town to keep up his psychic charade. The town finally turns on Gideon and he's rushed off to jail. The Pines get their home back and everything is back to normal. But then Stan finds out about the journals and is like, that's stupid, you're stupid, I'ma take this, and walks away with Dipper's journal. He goes back through his secret vending machine door or enters some secret lab and he has the other two journals. Okay. He puts the books together, revealing some weird blueprints, gets to work on a giant machine, pulls a lever, a portal opens up, and then season two. And things hit the ground running. Gravity Falls only lasted two seasons after all, so a lot got crammed into these 20 episodes. Let's see how much of it I can get through before my freaking brain explodes. A big chunk of this season is all about Dipper trying to find the author of the journals and get to the bottom of- FBI, open up! Oh crap. It's the feds! Yep, a couple government agents show up having picked up some strange activity from Stan's portal machine. But sketchy Grunkle Stan's just like, what? Nah. But whatever, the hunt for the author is on. Eventually, the gang finds a clue in a broken laptop taken from one of the author's old labs. A little label that says McGucket Labs. McGucket, also known as Old Man McGucket, is a nutso bonkers prospector guy in Gravity Falls who is like, a weirdly great inventor, but like, he's the author of the journals? Well, McGucket doesn't actually remember anything. That is, until Dipper shows him a page in the journal called The Blind Eye. He freaks out and it's time to investigate. They all head down to the Gravity Falls Museum of Natural History where they discover the Society of the Blind Eye, a secret society dedicated to erasing the minds of Gravity Falls citizens anytime they see something freaky or supernatural in town. Which means they do that a lot. They find a log of McGucket's memories and it turns out this crazy prospect guy used to be a brilliant inventor who worked alongside the man who wrote the journals. But one day he saw something so disturbing that he invented a device to help him forget about it. He started the Society of the Blind Eye and it was his own invention that drove him crazy. But on the bright side, with his memories mostly restored, he gets to work repairing the laptop and what he finds, it ain't pretty. Hey, Mr. Tummy. Hey, Mr. Stan. Okay. No. He discovers that something awful is about to happen to Gravity Falls. Some giant apocalyptic threat happening in the next 24 hours. Which happens to coincide with Stan turning on his giant portal machine under the mystery shack, causing weird shifts in gravity and starting a countdown until it fully activates. And then things really hit the fan. The mystery shack gets raided by a bunch of those government agents and Stan is arrested for suspicious activity, stealing drums of radioactive waste and creating a suspected doomsday device. Like a giant portal machine that makes gravity go all wacky. 
Uh oh. Dipper and Mabel try to find evidence to clear Stan's name, but instead they find a newspaper clipping about a car crash that killed Stan Pines, as well as one about this unnamed grifter in town. Huh. So Stan Pines isn't Stan Pines. I mean, he could be literally anyone then, we don't know. Also in that box was the code to the vending machine door. So the gang investigates and finds Stan's crazy lab, his giant machine, and the journals. And at this point, emotions are all over the place. Dipper is furious and is convinced Stan's a criminal who stole all the journals. But Mabel's still trying to give Stan the benefit of the doubt. Whatever's happening, they gotta turn off that machine. But just before they can do it, Stan bursts through the door and tells him to stop. Just then, gravity goes all nutso again, tossing everyone into separate corners of the lab, except Mabel, who manages to latch onto the deactivation switch. After pleading back and forth in one of the most dramatic things I've seen in a cartoon ever, Mabel decides to trust Stan's word, the countdown reaches zero, and... The machine goes off, the lab's destroyed, but a mysterious figure comes out of the portal. Someone with 12 fingers, and who looks almost exactly like Stan. This is Stan's brother. Stan. Flashback to New Jersey in the 1960s. You have the Pines twins, Stanford and Stanley. Stanford was born with six fingers on each hand and was a freaking genius, and Stanley was... Well, Grunkle Stan. These two were inseparable, but an accident with Stanford's science fair project in high school ruined his chances of getting into a prestigious college and drove a rift between the two of them. Stanley spent years after that peddling crappy scam products that would fail so bad he'd get run out of town, while Stanford freaking blasted through college and began to study scientific anomalies. Moving to a small town in Oregon that was known for its weird happenings and writing all of his findings down in a journal. <laughs> But just studying weird stuff wasn't enough. Stanford wanted to find the source of these anomalies, but kinda reached a dead end in his research and got desperate. So he summoned a mystical being for answers. Bill Cipher. And he was like, hey dude, if you let me invade your mind at will, I'll help you do your homework. And Stanford was like, this... This seems safe. It was Bill's idea to build a portal, so Stanford and his partner, Fiddleford McGucket, got to work. McGucket accidentally got his head stuck in the portal one day and discovered what was really on the other side. He saw some pretty messed up stuff, so he quit, and we know what happened after that. Bill tricked Stanford. He thought he was finally accomplishing his life's work, but he was really helping a demon emerge our dimension with his own crazy nightmare one. So Stanford shut the whole thing down and tried to hide all of his work so that no one could ever reactivate the portal. He had to hide the journals. So he called up Stanley and asked him to take a journal and get as far away as possible. But Stanley, who thought his brother was trying to reconnect, was just like, that that's it? He gets super upset and they start fighting. In all the chaos, Stanley accidentally pushes Stanford into the portal and the portal shuts down. Without the other two journals, there's no way to turn it back on. Stanford was stuck in another dimension. So Stanley began a new life in Gravity Falls, turned the house into the mystery shack, and took Stanford's name so that he could support himself and stay in town while he worked to find the journals, reactivate the machine, and save his brother. And on top of all that, he faked a car crash to kill his old self and start fresh. So, yeah. Th this is still a show for 10 year olds on the Disney Channel, right? <laughs> oh, crap. Uh, back in the present, the government is still after the Pines. But Stanford, or I'm just gonna call him Ford from now on, uses the blind eye mind erasing ray that Dipper kept with him to wipe all their memories and save the day. Hooray! But good lord, we are not done yet. See, when Stan turned on the portal machine, it created a little interdimensional rift that Ford encased in a globe, the most dangerous snow globe ever. If that rift ever broke, it'd give Bill Cipher an open window to slither into our dimension and cause trouble. So yeah, we gotta prepare for that. The Pines managed to bill-proof the shack with some magic junk just in time for the rift to start cracking. I'll just skip the build up and say Bill ended up tricking Mabel into handing over the rift and oops, Butterfingers, now the world's ending. It's weird Mageddon, everybody. The end of the world has never been so quirky. Bill and his gang of kooky demons hop into Gravity Falls and start wreaking havoc, turning people into stone and taking them to this weird pyramid in the sky. But due to the town's law of weirdness magnetism, I wasn't joking earlier, that's a real thing, Bill and his weirdness can't spread further than Gravity Falls. So, you know, 
Silver linings. Back in the apocalypse, Dipper manages to find Wendy and Seuss, and the three of them set off to find Mabel, who's trapped in a giant prison bubble that Bill created. Inside it is literally everything Mabel ever wanted. That way, she'd never want to leave. To make a long story short, she leaves. The gang bust her out and escape back to the mystery shack where they find Grunkle Stan and a bunch of their friends and side characters just hanging out. The bill proofing actually worked. Neat. So the gang meets up with McGucket and decides to turn the house into a freaking giant robot to fight Bill. Yeah, we're back on giant robots. And this also actually works. A fight breaks out between the house robot and the demons and it is so cool. And while Bill's distracted fighting the house, that's a weird sentence, the main gang break into Bill's castle, free Ford and the rest of the people who return to stone and start working on a plan to finally defeat Bill. But before they can really do anything, Bill shows back up up, captures a bunch of their friends, puts Dipper and Mabel in a cage, and demands Ford tell him how to break out of Gravity Falls. But luckily, Dipper and Mabel manage to distract Bill and escape long enough for the stands to come up with a new plan. Ford agrees to give Bill what he wants to save Dipper and Mabel. So, Bill enters Ford's mind and... Wait, that's not Stanford. Oh, Dip! The Stan switched clothes and tricked Bill into going into Stanley Pine's mind instead of Stanford's. And while Bill was inside Stan's head, Ford used the blind eye memory eraser to completely wipe Stan's mind, taking Bill with it. Woo! And with that, Bill is finally gone, the rift into the Nightmare Realm is closed, everyone's freed, and everything is back to normal. Except Stan still lost all his memories. He doesn't even remember his family for about two minutes until it all starts coming back. That didn't last long. And with the world saved and everything back to normal, it's time for summer vacation to end. Stan and Ford team up to go adventuring like they always wanted, Seuss gets put in charge of the mystery shack, and Dipper and Mabel leave Gravity Falls. And that is the entire story of Gravity Falls from beginning to end. Wait, if Bill Cipher was in Grunkle Stan's mind before it was erased, and Stan got all his memories back, wouldn't that mean Bill Cipher could come back too? Eh, who knows. Show's been over for four years, so it probably doesn't matter. Anyway, reality's an illusion, the universe is a hologram, bye gold, bye! All right, here's the big one. I've recapped Steven Universe and Gravity Falls, so now it's time to take on the last of the modern cartoon's big three, Adventure Time. Yes, Adventure Time, the Cartoon Network classic about a human boy named Finn and his best friend and shape-shifting magical dog named Jake going on crazy adventures in this fantasy land called Ooh to protect the Candy Kingdom, where literally everyone is a sentient piece of candy. They all got wavy noodle arms and say crazy wacky catchphrase and this show's about war. Yeah, things get a little crazy. And there's 10 freaking seasons, man. There's tons of side stories, backstories, and extra stuff, so I might have to over, oversimplify this one a bit. But before we get started, I will say, if you like this video and want to see more, be sure to head down and hit that big red subscribe button and the little bell next to it to make sure you never miss any future uploads. Literally no time to waste on this one, so let's start with season one. Does anything happen in season one? I mean, we got Finn and Jake partying, having fun, goofing around, and going on random adventures. They protect Princess Bubblegum, the leader of the Candy Kingdom and creator of all the candy people, from the Ice King, an evil princess-obsessed wizard who is kinda too stupid to be a real threat, but he just keeps popping up. Finn and Jake live in a treehouse with a sentient Game Boy named Beemo, Jake's date in a rainbow unicorn named Lady Rainicorn, etc, etc, etc. And all that is super fun and charming, but plot-wise, this season's pretty barren. Early Adventure Time is just pure shenanigans. And season two is mostly the same, but some wheels do start turning. See, when you watch the show, you might notice that Finn's kind of the only human around. And maybe this super buff girl he's friends with Susan Strong, but uh, that's for later. You might also spot a lot of weirdly modern technology just rotting away in this fantasy land. Like TVs and cars and... Oh. Oh! Yeah, so here's the thing. Adventure Time actually takes place on a post-apocalyptic Earth, 1,000 years after this intense nuclear conflict called the Mushroom Wars. And that war is super important. It actually provides a lot of context for Adventure Time's insanity. Case in point, Ice King. 
way back. Before all the magic and nuclear explosions and junk, the world was pretty much the way it is now, and we got this guy named Simon. Super smart, scholarly dude who studied antiques and lived with his fiance Betty, who he called his princess. But one day, he finds a crown. This thing was actually made millions of years ago by an ice elemental called Evergreen to grant a wish to whoever first wore it. First person to wear it just happened to wish to become an ice elemental like Evergreen. Couldn't have wished for a sandwich or something. So when Simon puts on the crown, it starts messing with his mind and giving him ice powers. He ends up scaring off Betty and never seeing her again. So he dedicates the rest of his life to studying the crown, with it slowly changing him the more he wears it. And after the bombs dropped, Simon was wearing the crown more and more to keep himself and this random little vampire girl named Marceline safe in the post-apocalyptic wasteland. So inevitably, the crown overtakes Simon and he goes goes full Ice King, completely forgetting everything about his own life, running off on his own, leaving Marceline behind, and spending the rest of his days kidnapping princesses. Oh! I get it now. This was heavy! We don't find any of this out until season three, and it's pretty much the first time Adventure Time really dove deep into character development. And considering the rest of the show was this... <laughs> Yeah. yeah! It hit pretty hard. But that's not even the worst thing to come out of the Mushroom Wars. Nah, that would be the Lich. This ready for picture day looker is a being of ultimate unstoppable evil that Princess Bubblegum it keeps in her attic. She's managed to contain him for a while, but just when she decides to show him to Finn and Jake, he escapes. You need better security than just tree sap, Bubblegum. You're better than that. And of course, then the Ice King kidnaps PB again. This is a good day. Finn gives the Lich a good beatdown, and I'm sure that will be the only time in this entire series that he ever has to defeat him. Oh, wait, spoke too soon. The Lich is now inside Princess Bubblegum, and she's turning into a giant monster. Finn and Jake team up with the Ice King to freeze her. She falls over, breaks into a bunch of pieces, and the doctors couldn't find all the gum to bring her back to normal, so now she's... younger? Is that how that works? Like, if I lose an arm, does that mean I'm like five years younger? But this is actually pretty interesting because Finn's been crushing on Bubblegum this whole show and now they're the same age. There was like a five year age gap between them, but actually not because Bubblegum's like 900 years old, but we don't know that at the time. So for all we know, they're the same age. So this could be a really interesting exploration of their friendship dynamic and how this changes things between them. But no, we don't see PB again for like six episodes, at which point she is immediately returned back to normal. Yep. So right when Finn finally had a chance to, well, have a chance with Bubblegum, it's tossed out the window like that. And Finn, uh, he doesn't take it well. Dude goes all emo, wallowing in sadness and cuddling a lock of PB's hair. You know, like a normal person. Dude, she's not dead, she's just too old for you. But then he falls in love with another girl, Flame Princess, in like five seconds and starts literally chasing after her, you know, like a normal person. But despite that, Finn and Flame Princess actually start hanging out and eventually dating for a while. Until Finn screws it all up and gets his butt dumped. And if things weren't bad enough for our slightly problematic hero, Finn's starting to have freaky premonition dreams about the Lich. And wouldn't you know it, that dang old Lich is back. He uses the dead body of Finn's childhood hero to trick Finn into opening a portal to the Time Room. That is an actual sentence that I wrote into a script and said out loud. In the Time Room. You can make one wish that creates an alternate dimension wish reality. The Lich uses his wish wish to extinguish all life, but Finn jumps in right behind him and wishes that the Lich never existed. And instead of creating a paradox that explodes the universe, it instead creates a separate reality where magic doesn't exist except for the crown, I guess. Finn's now a normal human boy with a nose and a robot arm. Standard human boy fare, and Jake is just a dog. They're living on a farm with an actual human family. This is so normal that it's weird. There's this whole ordeal where the Ice King sacrificed himself to freeze the bomb that caused the apocalypse. And with Simon dead, the crown was just like, ugh, this sucks, I'm bored, and plunged the earth into a 400 year ice age. And now, after the world went back to normal, that warhead just kinda sits there, still frozen and ready to go off any day. But Finn just sees the crown and is like, ooh, yoink. Big old dummy puts on the crown and just, 
Finn goes nuts and starts throwing ice everywhere. The commotion cracks the frozen warhead and what time is it? Apocalypse time. Oh, well, crap. Oh wait, there's Jake. You know, maybe this ain't all bad. Oh my God, Jake's got a lich up in him. This looks like the end for Finn and Jake. But then we cut to our Jake still chilling in the time room, just watching it all go down. It's a good use of time, my friend. Oh, that's right. Jake can still make a wish to fix all this. He wishes to change the lich's wish to, I wish for Finn and Jake to be back home safe in Ooh. Huh. That was way easier than I thought it would be. But wait, does that whole farm world dimension still exist? Uh, what about the Lich? They didn't kill him or anything. He's still out there. What are they gonna do about- <gasps> Look, puppies! Jake and Lady Rainicorn had puppies! They grow up by the end of the first episode and don't really play into the plot after that, but- Puppies! Oh, uh, and Finn broke his sword, now he's got a new one. A fancy one that's made out of grass, attached to his arm at all times, and is apparently cursed. I'm sure there's no reason to look into that anymore right now, so let's see what's going on with the Ice King. Wait, what? So, one day, Ice King got hit with a wave of some kind of anti-magic, reverting him back into Simon. And while he's come to his senses, he opens up a time portal so he can say goodbye to Betty. But Betty pulls a galaxy brain move and just jumps through the time portal. Yeah! Poop. Betty runs off to try and find a way to reverse whatever magic is keeping Ice King all Dumbo in the brain and bring back Simon. So in the meantime, jumping back to Finn, dude gets a massive drama bomb dropped on him when he finds out that his dad is still alive and in some giant space prison called the Citadel. Finn and Jake hop over there immediately, but because nothing is ever easy, the Lich goes too. He starts using goopy gray gunk to free all the prisoners, including this human guy named Mark. Martin. That's Finn's dad, and he's a total bum. The Lich starts closing in on Finn as Martin bails to try to escape. But Finn douses the Lich with this weird regeneration juice that turns the Lich into... a, a giant baby? That's, uh... That's pretty weird. But no time for that right now. Finn's dad's about to get away. Finn tries to pull down the big rock Martin's escaping on, but he just isn't strong enough. But then his cursed grass sword randomly switches into maximum overdrive to try and help Finn and... Oh God! Finn's arm popped off. Oh, and it sprouted a cute little flower. But also, ah! Well, that could have gone better. Finn and Jake head back to Ooh, leave the giant harmless baby lich on some old couple's doorstep, and things go back to normal for a bit. Er, well, as normal as things can be when you've lost an arm. Eh, don't worry. A bee voiced by Chloe from Life is Strange falls in love with Finn's weird arm flower, and somehow that makes it turn into a tree, explode, and then turn into a fresh new arm for Finn with a little thorn sticking out of the palm. I don't know how any of this works. Hey, wait, who's that over there? Oh, right, Betty! Forgot she was a thing. She's working with this guy named Magic Man now. Magic Man is a jerk. He turned Finn into a giant foot back in season one, so you can tell he's pretty messed up. Also, he's apparently from Mars, so there's that. But when their experiment goes wrong, Betty winds up absorbing all of Magic Man's powers, as well as his jerkiness, making Betty crazy and magical and making Magic Man just normal man. Dude just kind of dips back to Mars after that. Gee, that sucks. Hey, what's going on in the Ice Kingdom? Well, Ice King's just kind of chilling with his penguins, including his favorite, Gunter. Gunter. Gunther. They say it a bunch of different ways in the show, and I don't know which one's the right one. Aw, look how cute he is. You would never even guess that he's actually an ancient cosmic entity called the Orgalorg, who was banished to Earth for attempting to take over the solar system by consuming the power of a comet that was barreling towards the planet. Yeah. And hey, there just so happens to be another comet barreling towards Earth right now! So the Orgalorg takes over Gunter and springs into space to try for a do-over. But Finn goes right up after him, only to find... his dad? In the mouth of a giant moth. It makes a bit more sense when you watch the whole show. Like I said, I'm kinda having to oversimplify things here for the sake of time. So Finn and Martin wander space for a bit until they find the Orgalorg chowing down on a comet. Finn jumps inside the Orgalorg's mouth, the thorn in his arm sprouts into a giant grass tentacle, and he absolutely wrecks the Orgalorg. But uh, then the comet breaks open and reveals some other kind of cosmic entity, and they're like, Finn. You were a comet once, I guess. You lived many lives over millions of years. You created me. Or maybe you didn't, I don't know. Hey, you wanna hang? Just you and me. We can travel to the end and beginning of all things together. 
Or I guess you can stay on Earth and do Earth junk if you want. Finn's like, Earth junk, please. But Martin decides to take the comet up on their deal. So, Martin doesn't exist anymore. And that's the end of season six. What the heck did I just watch? That was the weirdest season finale I've ever seen. That was weirder to me than Weird Mageddon, the finale that was meant to be as weird as it could be. The first time I saw this, it went in my head, but all I processed was... Anyway, now it's season seven and everyone starts calling Princess Bubblegum by her real name for some reason. Her name is Bonnabelle, or Bonnie for short. They revealed this name in season two, I think. But now it's becoming a pretty regular thing, so I'm gonna do the same thing in my video. One day, Bonnie's just chilling in this cabin she grew up in when Marceline, that vampire girl Simon protected back during the Mushroom Wars, literally bursts in and asks Bonnie to make her not a vampire anymore. We've seen Marceline countless times in the series at this point. She's a vampire, but she's not evil. She's friends with Finn and Jake. She plays bass. She's a fan favorite. She just hasn't been super plot relevant till now. But trust me, her wanting to not be a vampire anymore is a big deal. So Bonnie tosses Marceline into this machine and zaps all the vampire out of her. But that wakes up a bunch of evil vampires that Marceline had slain years before. So Marcy and Bonnie, and Finn and Jake, take out all the vampires before they can cause trouble. Bonnabelle and Marceline have a lot of really cute bonding moments, heavily implying that they got a bit of a past. And after doing a bunch of slaying, all the vampires are gone. Well, except Marceline. By slaying all the vampires, she absorbed their powers, which means she's back to the way she started. But eh, she's cool with it now. Glad we went through all that then. So we've kind of danced around this for a while now, but what the heck is going on with the whole grass sword thing? Okay, so after Finn got his new arm, he started using this new sword that had some kind of sentient Finn consciousness inside it. It's called the Finn Sword. But when someone steals Finn's Finn Sword, making Finn's Finn arms sprout Finn's Finn grass sword again, he accidentally breaks both of them. And that makes Finn Big sad. And it makes the consciousness of the two swords meld together. Fast forward a bit and Finn is getting into a huge fight with Susan Strong, remember her? Well now she's not only confirmed to be human, but we even find out she's got some kind of funky mods installed in her head that are making her go crazy. She beats Finn up and throws him to the ground, but Finn's arm is just like, oh, heck no, you do not mess with my rest of me like that. And that big grass tentacle sprouts again, knocks Susan on her butt and then totally ditches Finn's arm to go grab Finn's discarded Finn sword. This boy cannot keep an arm to save his life. The two swords merge together and create Fern, a sentient grass dude who is convinced he's Finn. Dude's got a lot of issues to work out, so he rides off into the sunset for a while, but don't worry, He'll be back. In the meantime, Bubblegum gives Finn this fresh new high-tech robot arm that has a bunch of different features and abilities. Remember that. And speaking of robots, this giant Stingray robot randomly just showed up on Ooh looking for Susan, but it also recognizes Finn for some reason. Obviously, this is suspicious as but So Finn, Jake, and Susan all set off to find where this weird Stingray ship came from. They end up on this super fancy high-tech island where they find, whoa! That's a humans. That's a veritable baker's dozen of humans. And why does that one look so much like Finn? Well, funny you should ask. Me, because that is Dr. Minerva, Finn's mom. Oh, okay. You're just gonna drop that one on us like that, all right. Minerva's lived on this island her whole life. This is where she fell in love with Martin and had Finn before a series of unfortunate events led to Martin running away from people trying to hurt him, leaving Finn on a raft in the middle of the ocean while trying to protect him, and Minerva being left on the island by herself with no idea what even happened. These days, the real Minerva's not really around anymore because she put herself in cryostasis and uploaded her consciousness to a ton of robot clones so she could help protect her people from a deadly virus that spread across the island, wiped out all their health workers, and couldn't be stopped by quarantining. Okay, this just crossed the line into official too real territory, and I am not okay with that. But yeah, now Finn's mom is a consciousness spread across a ton of robots to keep the humans safe. And now that her son's come back to her, she will not let him leave. But Finn's like, yo, that mess is dumb and stupid and wrong. Minerva's like, 
Yeah, you're probably right. And then they leave. Oh, except Susan. This island's actually where she grew up, so she meets up with an old friend and they head off to have new adventures. Oh, and her real name's apparently Kara. We don't really see her again after that, so Finn and Jake say their goodbyes and head back to Ooh, randomly picking up this vial of nightmare juice from a dream demon on the way back. I know that's a little out of nowhere, but trust me, it's important. The guys get back home just in time for season nine. We're in the home stretch here, people. And good thing too, cause my brain is mushing out on me. Which is appropriate, cause while Finn and Jake were gone, Ooh totally mushed out on them. Place is a mess. Apparently, this ice elemental, Patient St. Pym, used Betty's newfound crazy magic to cast a mega spell that made the other elementals go crazy and corrupted all of Ooh, splitting it into four sections. Fire, ice, candy, and Slime. Betty tells Finn that they can reverse the corruption if they get all the royal elemental jewels. But once he does, Betty just yoinks him and bails. Ah, poop. Yeah, Betty doesn't really give a crap about anything other than Ice King, so she tricked Finn into bringing her the jewels so she could run more experiments to bring back Simon. But you know that Ice King. He's dumb. Dude doesn't even register what's going on and messes up her whole experiment, blowing her up in the process. Don't worry, she's fine. She's just on Mars now. It makes sense. Ice King brings the jewels back to Finn, who's hanging out with Lumpy Space Princess. Now, Lumpy's been a fan favorite recurring character since season one, but she's never really been super plot relevant. Not until now. See, LSP here is actually immune to the corruption that's messing with Ooh and its people. So with all the jewels in hand, Lumpy Space Princess suction cups herself to the ground and runs a full system reset, turning everything back to normal. Hooray, LSP served a purpose, but things in Ooh don't stay good for very long. Fern starts having a total existential crisis and goes a little bit crazy. Apparently, this magic grass dude randomly developed the power to cloak himself to look exactly like the real Finn. So he attacks real Finn and tries to kill him so he can take his place. You know, like a normal person. Finn obviously doesn't want to hurt him, but he accidentally activates one of his robot arm special abilities that completely mulches Fern. So he's dead. And as you might expect, accidentally murdering someone who looks exactly like you is just a wee bit traumatizing. So as we enter Adventure Time's 10th and final season, that whole ordeal is weighing really heavily on Finn. That is until, oops, Fern's back. And now he's tall. And he's got friends. Friends that look like they could be Princess Bubblegum's family or something. Well, that's because they are. These are the Bubblegums. I don't know if that's their official collective name, but that's what I'm gonna call them. There's Cousin Chicle, Aunt Lolly, and Uncle Gumball... Duh. Save that one. Princess Bubblegum created them when she was little, and things were pretty chill at first. But little did Bonnie know, her family was secretly conspiring against her. Bonnie was like, ain't all this candy nature dope? Let's plant trees. But Gumball was like, money. <laughs> he wanted to build apartment buildings and sell merch and stuff, and wanted Bonnie to stop standing in his way. So he created this goop that would turn Bonnie into a big old dum-dum, and the whole family was in on it. That is, until Gumball tricks the other two into taking the dum-dum juice, and they got turned into... Oh, wait, those are... those are candy people. We've seen those guys tons of times this whole show. Oh, this just got way darker, dude. Luckily, Bonnie manages to use the Dum Dum Juice on Gumbald and save herself. And that's pretty much how the Candy Kingdom got started. But here's the thing. When Lumpy Space Princess reset Ooh in season nine, she also reset these candy people back to their original forms the bubblegums. And they want revenge. Okay, this is getting serious. Like, Big serious. Bonnabelle and Gumbald are prepared to go to full on war with each other. The troops meet on the battlefield and stuff's about to go down. But then Jake jumps in with the nightmare juice, how convenient that they just happened to get that right before a war, and everyone gets knocked out into a dream state where they work out their differences. Finn and Fern are cool now, and PB and Gumbald decide to call a truce. Except he was actually gonna double cross her anyway, so Aunt Lolly jumped in and dum dum them. That is a very perceptive piece of gum. Oh, and Fern's dying. Yeah, they like killed the grass demon thing inside him during the dream, and that's made his body unstable somehow, and now he's withering away. I don't know. Show's weird. But yeah, looks like the war's off. Seems like a pretty anticlimactic ending. Oh, crap. So? 
This is Golb. He's an ancient, giant demon baby of chaos summoned by Betty and Normal Man as part of Betty's plans to bring back Simon. And Golb is just wrecking the place. Ice King goes over to Betty and makes her experiment blow up. Yeah, again, classic Ice King. But then Golb full on swallows Finn, Betty, and Ice King and starts digesting them in his stomach. And I don't mean digesting like with stomach acid. I mean they are being broken down to their essential forms, which is kind of just a convenient way to have the crown reset and have Ice King turn back into Simon permanently. Which is nice, but that reunion is short-lived because the walls start closing in. They're gonna get smashed, dude. Meanwhile, everyone else is still fighting Golb's monsters. Bubblegum gets full-on crushed, and Marceline, who I forgot to mention is also there, panics. But when she realizes Bonnie's okay, she rushes over to hug her and... <gasps> Aww, they kiss. That's so sweet. Oh, and I guess Finn's gonna die, or whatever. In classic Cartoon Network style, everyone starts singing to solve their problems. And Golb hates their song so much that his stomach starts opening up, letting Simon and Finn escape. Betty stays behind and uses the newly reset crown to wish that she would become Golb herself so that she can leave Ooh, sacrificing herself to keep Simon safe. And with that, it's all over. Not everyone made it out alive in the end, but the fighting is over. And so is Adventure Time. We get a really amazing montage of everyone's lives after the war and a glimpse into the future of Ooh, but yeah. After all this, that is the story of Adventure Time from beginning to end. Okay, hear me out. Or what if we announce four brand new specials only a year after the finale? And thus, Adventure Time Distant Lands was born. A series of four original and mostly unconnected Adventure Time specials released on HBO Max over the last year. And considering I've already done a big ol' recap of all 10 Adventure Time seasons, it only makes sense to hop back into Adventure Time for a bit to talk Distant Lands. This is everything you need to know about Adventure Time Distant Lands. As usual, a lot of things will have to be oversimplified here because there's a lot to get through. So this whole shebang starts with Bimo, the sentient Game Boy that lives with Finn and Jake in their first special, Bimo. We start with Bimo out in outer space, flying around and singing about starting a potato farm on Mars. Yeah. This is adventure time, all right. But then they're thrown way off course and crash land on a mysterious space station called the Drift. And this place is in pretty bad shape, but no time to think about that now. Look, conflict! Some aliens are fighting over a glowy green thing, but Bimo's ship crashes on top of it, and that takes care of that. Naturally, they all get a little ticked at Bimo and chase after him. But then, swoop! Bimo is saved by this bunny girl named Y5. She's a scavenger on the Drift, looking for useful tech to bring to some guy named Hugo. Bimo sparks some interest around the Drift after helping stop a breach in its hull, and soon, Y5 and Bimo are met by this super shady looking guy named Mr. M, who I'm like 99.99% .99 sure is Finn's dad, Martin. We never see his face or anything, but I mean, Martin, Mr. M, they got the same voice actor. Yeah, uh, theory confirmed. And knowing that, we know that Mr. M here can't be trusted. But the gang doesn't know that, so they follow him to this giant super gumball thing called the Unity Pod. And inside the pod is Hugo, an alien elf scientist man who seems to be the leader of this whole place and the one in charge of building the Unity Pod, which he claims will fix all the problems with the drift. Breaches and malfunctions have been happening all over the place, so they gotta try and make them not happen. But the pod is missing one last piece called a Genesis Crystal, which is trapped in a super dangerous part of the drift called the Jungle Pod. But Bimo B and Bimo, they're just like, I can do it, just tell me who I need to kill. And Hugo's like, all right. So Bimo hops over to the jungle pod with Mr. M, grabs the Genesis crystal, and experiences instant regret as the entire pod is thrown into chaos and the plants start chasing after them. Mr. M makes off with the crystal, traps Bimo inside the pod, and Bimo dies. Some of the angry plants attack and break them into a million pieces. So Bimo's dead. Back at the Unity Pod, Y5 discovers that Mr. M has been secretly surveying the entire drift, looking for parts to salvage for the Unity Pod. And every time something gets salvaged, its pod fails and shuts down. That's why the malfunctions and breaches have been happening. Building the Unity Pod is actively killing the drift. And that's a bad thing. Y5 is like, uh... <laughs> she rushes off to get BMO, finding their... A corpse? Does this count as a corpse? Anyway, Y5 takes Bimo to get fixed up by, oh, another Bimo bot. 
Huh. So yeah, this is Seago, a way older bot very similar to Bemo, who was actually created by Hugo. And they're like, Hugo? Oh yeah, that guy sucks. And that Unity pod is just his ticket to ditch this place and leave you losers behind. So yeah. That's bad. But hey, Bemo's back together. This is a silver lining. So the gang runs back to the Unity Pod to expose Hugo for the fraud he is. And give the guy credit, he comes clean pretty easily. He's like, <laughs> yeah, I totally just built this thing so I can zap all your power and bounce. And now that Mr. M's given him the Genesis Crystal, Hugo starts up the pod, hops inside, and smashes the controls. What are we gonna do? Well, Bemo's like, why don't we all just unplug the pod and chuck it into space before it can zap the power? And everyone else is just like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, so they do that. Hooray! The drift is saved and Hugo and Mr. M are aimlessly floating through space. And with that, it's time for BMO to mosey on. They set back off into space and fly to, oh, Earth, where they meet a little human boy in a stupid hat and a magic yellow dog. Surprise! This was a prequel the whole time. And that's Bemo. One special down, three to go. Next up, Obsidian. We start this one in a new location for the series, as far as I can remember, leave me alone. The Glass Kingdom. A long time ago, this place was attacked by a giant dragon called Moto Larvo, but was saved by our favorite vampire demon bassist, Marceline the Vampire Queen. She sang a song and the dragon backed off, retiring inside a mountain called The Furnace, a place where glass citizens used to go to fix themselves when they got cracked. Flash forward many, many, many years later, and a young glass boy sneaks into the furnace to try and fix a crack in his head that everyone makes fun of him for. And naturally, stumbling into the resting place of the dragon that nearly wiped out your entire civilization, is a bad idea. Glass Boy accidentally wakes up Moto Larvo, putting the entire Glass Kingdom in immediate, terrible danger. So to make up for dooming his people, Glass Boy sets off to find Marceline, who's been living a pretty chill, normal life with her girlfriend, Princess Bubblegum. Yeah, so I know the last special was a prequel, but we're off into sequel town now. Glass Boy makes it to Marceline's house and is like, help, but Marceline and Bubblegum are actually kind of hesitant to say yes. Glass Boy's just like, come on. Seriously? So it's off to the Glass Kingdom. Cut to the furnace where Marcy reprises her old song and it's a diss track at Bubblegum. Yeah, so the song Marceline played all those years ago came from an argument between her and Bubblegum. And that became the day they first broke up way back when. So this is more than a little awkward. And worst of all, it don't work! So out of nowhere, Bubblegum calls in a surprise, surprise giant bird who drops a fancy force field machine down that manages to keep Molto Larvo inside the furnace for now. Basically, Bubblegum had a secret plan B this whole time in case Marceline failed, which is also more than a little awkward and leads to another argument. Bubblegum's plans fall through and Molto Larvo is now loose in the city. Things are going really well. Glass Boy lures the dragon into the furnace, Marcy and PB chase after him, and a malfunction with the force field caused by these three characters who are lame, so I don't want to talk about them, all leads to Glass Boy, Marceline, and Bubblegum getting trapped inside the furnace. The dragon is stuck under some rubble for now, so with what little time they have left, Marceline and Bubblegum make up, and Marcy sings a really sweet love song. A song that causes Molto Larvo to get all introspective. Apparently, they used to be this cute little fish thing that went into hiding after being attacked and nearly killed. They covered up their scar with a shell and over the years grew old and angry. But after hearing Marceline's song, they remove the shell, the scar starts glowing, and then they, uh, they break open and turn into a glowing cat Butterfly? How many animals is this thing? So the dragon's not a threat anymore. Marcy, Bubblegum, and Glass Boy manage to escape from the furnace. And that's basically it. Next special, Wizard City. Okay, so for this one, we gotta start with the character I kinda glossed over in my first recap, Peppermint Butler. Long running character in the show, Princess Bubblegum's butler, also an avid user of dark magic. Near the end of the original series, he came into contact with Dum Dum Juice, the stuff made by Bubblegum's evil uncle Gumball that turns anyone it touches into a harmless, stupid candy person. So when Peppermint Butler got doused with it, he reverted back to a stupid little baby mint. Now, many years later, Baby Peppermint Boy is trying to attend a magic school in Wizard City to learn to become a powerful dark wizard again. The only problem is, in Wizard City, dark magic is illegal. And funnily enough, a peppermint butler is also illegal in Wizard City. Yeah, apparently this dude is an infamous and feared dark wizard here, banned from ever returning. So yeah, 
that's not gonna make life easier for our little peppermint boy. And he's already not having the best time. He donked up his audition for magic school, only barely got accepted. He's getting bullied by these cool kids, and he got shoved into the loser house with this girl named Kadebra. Kadebra's really not interested in real magic. She prefers stage magic. Sleight of hand, the fake junk. She's also the niece of classic Adventure Time character Abraka Daniel. So that's kind of neat. But you know what's not neat? Murder. Hey, uh, Editor Fofi here. I'm about to start talking about a character named Spader, and I just realized that I called him Saber, like, the entire video. I've been editing this video for a very long time, and honestly, I don't really feel like re-recording those lines right now. So, just know, between you and me, anytime I call this guy Saber, I meant Spader. Is that okay? Cool, thanks. One night, Peppermint Boy's bully, Saber, mysteriously goes missing and is thought to be dead. And Saber's friend, Blaine, starts suspecting Peppermint Boy might have had something to do with it. You know, what with his poor relationship with Saber, his use of dark magic, and the fact that a ghostly apparition of the real Peppermint Butler barfed itself out of Peppermint Boy's mouth and told him to show Saber who's boss, loudly, in the same room as Blaine. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna raise suspicion. So Blaine starts snooping around Peppermint Boy's stuff, discovers his identity through a photo album of all things, really think he would have left that one at home, and of course, calls the cops on him. So our hero is now being arrested as the main suspect of a murder. That's always a good thing. But Peppermint Boy manages to escape the cops and runs off into hiding. Now, here's where things get weird fast. And simplifying it for this recap is only gonna make it more weird, but just stick with me here. Peppermint Boy is found by Kadebra and one of their teachers who's like, Peppermint Boy, oh, I'm so glad you're safe. Here, follow me into this dark tomb and check out this wicked throne with a skeleton on it. Uh, okay. That's pretty out of nowhere. Also, that skeleton looks familiar. Why are people in robes emerging from the shadows? Yeah, okay, so this is the tomb of Kokontepi, the resting place of a giant cosmic entity who seems to be where all the magic and ooh came from, or something like that. The people in the robes are a bunch of teachers from the school looking to revive Kokontepi and bring about a new age of terror and dark magic. Cool! All they have to do is find a worthy host who can handle all the dark magic and power, which they've not had much luck with. But a dark wizard like Peppermint Butler would be the perfect candidate. So they give Peppermint Boy Icor. It's some gross, goopy magic junk that oozes out of Kokentepi's corpse. Apparently it contains their power. Peppermint Boy drinks it and... Oh my god! He morphs into this giant, uncontrollable monster, kills all the teachers, <laughs> hardcore, and it's about to wreak havoc all over Wizard City. But just then, Kadebra swoops in and uses her fun stage magic to distract Peppermint Monster so she can deliver one swift magic punch to the gut. Peppermint Monster barfs up the I-Core, returns to normal, and the world is saved. Yeah, there's some stuff about how Peppermint Boy doesn't want to be like Peppermint Butler, that ghost of Pep-Butt that lives in his mouth evaporates into nothingness, Peppermint Boy and Kadebra are friends forever now, and that's pretty much the end of this very, very normal special. Oh, and that skeleton was definitely Saber. A child was murdered in this special. No need to address that because we've reached the final special together again. We're finally back with our favorite boys, Finn and Jake, and guess what? They're dead. Yep. Our good boy Finn has found himself in the afterlife, dead as a doornail. And despite now being one of the many, many corpses in this video, Finn is just super excited to finally meet up with Jake again in the afterlife. But instead of finding his long lost friend who passed away many years ago, Finn finds this fox dude. Okay, I know this guy's a returning character, but I can't remember his name for the life of me. Hold on. Oh. Oh, he's just called Mr. Fox. I could have guessed that. Finn's like, take me to my dog! And Mr. Fox is just like, yeah, yeah, you're gonna have to take that up with management. So Finn barges into this castle to meet with Death. But we've seen Death in Adventure Time before, and uh... This ain't them. Yeah, this is New Death, the son of Old Death who accidentally inherited the job after killing his dad. Dude killed Death. By all accounts, that should have caused a paradox that consumed all of time and space, but nah, New Death's just kind of a jerk. He thinks all this afterlife junk is stupid and is just trying to destroy it all. So, yeah. I should probably explain. The place Finn's at right now is called the Dead Worlds, a form of afterlife with 50 different levels. Level one is endless misery, and level 50 is basically nirvana. Souls can rest in their assigned dead worlds, or they can be reincarnated for another chance at life. And New Death wants to get rid of all of that. Legit, he wants the afterlife to just be the endless misery and nothing else. So Finn's gotta stop him. 
well, kinda. He mainly just wants to find Jake. So he runs off and starts hopping from Dead World to Dead World looking for him. Apparently that dude made it all the way to Dead World 50, so Finn's got a lot of searching to do. Meanwhile, New Death just keeps blowing up all the other Dead Worlds, but the only one he can't access is number 50. So when Finn eventually finds Jake and he descends from Nirvana, New Death just hops in and takes his opportunity to blow the place up, sending every single soul down to Dead World 1, the one that sucks a lot. And I mean, even for Finn and Jake, trying to take on Death himself is kind of a big ask. So things are looking pretty hopeless. That is until Jake suggests contacting someone outside the Dead Worlds. And Finn's just like, you could do that this whole time? So they contact Peppermint Butler, who's looking back to his old self again. He uses magic to grant Finn and Jake temporary access to the realm of the goddess Life. Life being the person who gives souls, well, life. And she's also New Death's mom, but she's pretty uninterested in helping the crumbling Dead Worlds or even dealing with her son at all. That is until she learns he's trying to get rid of reincarnation. Then she gets mad. Didn't care at all until it affected her personally. Unbelievable. So life gives Finn and Jake a magic stick called the Kiss of Life, claiming it has the power to conquer death. Like literally, this stick will kill her son. But uh, remember how I said New Death accidentally inherited the responsibilities of Old Death after he killed him? Yeah, whoever takes out New Death is gonna have to become New New Death. So that's gonna be a problem. But things only get worse when we discover that New Death this entire time has been puppeted by Guess who? That's right, it's the freaking Lich again. You know, the Lich. One of the main recurring villains from the show who just never quite seems to be gone for good. Yeah, him. Even in death, Finn and Jake cannot escape this guy. So now it's a final face-off between Finn and Jake and the Death Lich. Holy crap, that's a cool name. But Finn and Jake know that whichever one of them takes him out has to become the new, new death. And they start fighting each other over who's gonna sacrifice themselves. But then Mr. Fox randomly walks in, sees them arguing over the kiss of life, and just yoinks it from him. The Death Lich attacks, Mr. Fox uses the stick, bada bing, bada boom, Mr. Fox is the new, new death. And just for good measure, Jake flings what's left of the Lich out into the never-ending void. So things in the dead world can go back to normal now, and all that's left is for Finn and Jake to settle down into their dead worlds. But Finn decides he'd rather take another shot at life. He spent so much time just waiting to be with Jake again, so he wants to be reincarnated and live a new life. One where he can be more in the moment instead of just waiting to die, I guess. But Jake's like, eh. I'm just gonna come with you. They hop back into the world of the living, ready to be reincarnated, and with that, we reach the end of Finn and Jake's story. For real this time. And with it, the true final ending of Adventure Time. Oh, come on, there's a spinoff now? Adventure Time's just never gonna end, is it? This Cartoon Network classic from like 2010 ran for a whole 10 seasons, then scored an extra four specials only like a year later. And now the Adventure Time universe expands even more with the new spinoff series, Fiona and Cake. So where'd all this come from? Well, this junk goes all the way back to 2011 in season three, episode nine of Adventure Time, Fiona and Cake. This was a fun alternate universe story featuring an entirely gender swapped version of the Adventure Time cast. Finn was now Fiona, Jake was Cake, Princess Bubblegum was Prince Gumball, Ice King was the Ice Queen, etc., etc. And speaking of the Ice King, the twist of the whole episode was that it was all a fan fiction made up by the Ice King. And now that little one-off episode from 12 years ago has become the springboard for a whole new, much more adult-oriented Adventure Time spin-off series. That's right, Ice King can swear now. And of course, another season of Adventure Time means now I gotta swoop in with my dumb voice and bad drawings to recap the whole series for you right here. Not to replace watching the show or anything, but just to be like, I don't know, a Sparknotes version. But I have to say now, Fiona and Cake isn't just some silly cartoon spin-off. This is a full canon continuation of the Adventure Time series, and it is not particularly friendly to newcomers. To fully understand and appreciate the places this show goes, you kinda gotta know your Adventure Time lore. All 13 years of it. I'm not joking. This stuff goes pretty deep right out of the gate. So if you haven't seen it already, you may wanna check out my other recap of the main Adventure Time series and the Distant Land specials to get a quick refresh on the mountain of lore this show is based on. And with all that said, this is everything you need to know about Adventure Time, Fiona, and Cake. So we start the series with Fiona and Cake waking up from a weird dream where they were in a magical world fighting evil and saving people and stuff, but pfft, that's silly. That's not what Fiona and Cake is, she's stupid. Fiona's not a fearless warrior in a magical world. She's just your average 20 something in a crappy apartment having trouble keeping a job. And Cake is just a cat 
regular cat. Look at my friend's cat, regular cat, just like him. Fiona lives your average city sitcom lifestyle with her friends Gary Prince, Bubblegum, and Marshall Lee, Marceline, who I'm sure won't have their differences, but discover their two sides of the same coin and ultimately get together in a very sweet and romantic way. I have absolutely no reason to believe any of that will happen based on any past source material. So anyway, uh, Fiona's having a bad day. She got fired from her job, Cake's acting up, and for some reason, neither of them can get that weird dream off their mind. Fiona keeps thinking about this ice prince she saw in the dream, and Cake has just become absolutely fascinated by ice stuff in general. Like, it makes her act all crazy. To the point that she ran off, jumped inside an ice cream vendor's cart, and just disappeared straight up vanished. Meanwhile, in a more familiar territory, we find Simon Petrikov in the land of Ooh. You remember him, right? That dude who put on a cursed crown that made him go crazy and become the Ice King? In the main Adventure Time finale, he was turned back into his normal self thanks to his old love, Betty, who summoned an unimaginable demon of chaos called Golb and then sacrificed herself to become Golb so that Simon could be safe. Yeah, like I said, this show really expects you to know your Adventure Time lore going in. So Simon is not doing so hot either. He's a 20th century dude who just blinked back into consciousness in an insane, surreal, post-apocalyptic future full of magic and junk. Dude's like a living museum exhibit here, literally. His house is also a museum exhibit for people to learn about the 20th century. Simon just doesn't fit in with all these new future humans living on an island full of clones of Finn's mom. Please know your lore before watching this show. But he also feels out of place in the more magical parts of Ooh too. Plus, his relationship to his past life as the Ice King is complicated, and that complicated relationship also extends to Fiona and Cake, the fanfic that the Ice King wrote. He hates being reminded of them, but they've actually caught on as kind of a popular story series with everyone in Ooh, so people are constantly asking him about it. Dude's just lost, he even kind of misses being the Ice King. He's like, you know, things were so simple back then. You know, sometimes I even like to dress up as the Ice King. I've made the costume myself, I'd go to conventions and everything. You know, there were a lot of people there dressed up like you, Finn. Damn! Oh, okay. Uh, maybe not exactly like you now. Yeah, Finn's buff now. Doesn't really matter, just felt like pointing it out since Finn doesn't actually show up too much in this series. Anyway, uh, back at his house, turns out Simon's been into some freaky stuff. He's been secretly working on a spell in order to open a portal to find Golb slash Betty. But instead, a portal randomly opens in the back of his head and out pops Cake. And eventually Fiona too. Oh, I get it. Fiona and Cake exist in a physical alternate dimension existing solely inside Simon's head. Okay, I see it, I get it. No, seriously, that makes total sense, as weird as it sounds. Alternate universes are absolutely a thing in Adventure Time, going back to like season five. See, there's this dude named Prismo the Wishmaster. He's a pink shadow on a wall who exists only in this thing called the Time Room. It's a little yellow cube in space. Prismo grants wishes to people, and those wishes tend to create new wish-altered realities. So Prismo also watches over the resulting multiverse. But you know, one day dude just got bored and decided to make his own universe. But after creating his characters, he realized he kinda just copied Finn and Jake and just ran with it. That's Fiona and Cake. But uh, creating your own universe is a big, big, like, cosmic no-no. Prismo basically broke some kind of multi-dimensional law by creating an unauthorized world that is literally not allowed to be part of the multiverse. So to hide it, he just uh, zapped it into the Ice King's noggin. Not, not like he was using it for all that much. But when Ice King lost his magic and turned back into Simon, the magical universe in his brain also got turned into just a normal town in like the late 90s or something. So that's how we got to here. And when Prismo sees that his world has gone rogue and crossed over into another, he panics, zaps Fiona and Cake into the time room and is like, wait, why are you like that? And he snaps his fingers and boom, Fiona and Cake are now uh, on model. Cake is now a full-fledged magical talking creature and Fiona, Got a costume change. Prismo then zaps Simon into the room where we get to see his time, time bugs. bugs. Prismo finds out what Simon's been up to, trying to open portals and junk, and they start arguing about it, blah, blah, blah. But they can't really waste too much time because then the Scarab shows up. The Scarab is a quote unquote God auditor who's out here keeping cosmic entities in line. The crossover between two worlds, one of them being unauthorized, caught his attention, and now he's on the hunt to expose Prismo's crime, turn him into their boss, take down the unauthorized universe, and then take over Prismo's job to control the multiverse himself. That's bad. 
That's a lot of bad. So in a last ditch effort to save them, Prismo gives Fiona and Cake a remote control that lets them hop through the multiverse at will. The Scarab then traps Prismo in this weird little cube prison. Fiona, Cake, and Simon all escape, and just like that, the chase is on. Fiona and Cake are on the run, the Scarab's chasing them through the multiverse, and Simon is just kind of there too. Well, <laughs> okay, that's not fair. But once they're all safe in this, uh, random corn dimension, Simon does come up with a plan. In order to save Fiona and Cake's world and make it magical again, he's gonna find another magic crown in the multiverse and use it to become the Ice King again. Yeah, I know he said he kind of hated being the Ice King, but he also kind of hates himself now, so he doesn't really view his life as meaningful, so he's just kind of willing to like just toss it. And no one really questions that, so it's a hunt for the crown. Unfortunately, in this world, the crown was destroyed, straight down to ashes, but they were able to find one of the crown's jewels, using it to mod the remote to track the crown through other universes. So the gang just kind of hop from world to world for a couple of episodes, you know, meeting different universe versions of themselves, who are sometimes really cool, sometimes really lame, and sometimes seem really cool, but turn out to be really lame, and you learn a lesson by the end. But throughout the whole thing, no crown. It, baby dimension. Baby dimension. Next! After a few hops, the gang lands in a version of Ooh that's just completely barren. No one and nothing anywhere. And to make things worse, their remote is completely busted, so they are stuck. So while they explore the wasteland, Simon tells Fiona all about Betty. How they met, fell in love, went on adventures, and how Betty kind of sacrificed a lot of her future just to be with Simon, in more ways than one. But the sentimental stories get cut short when the gang finds Bimo! Hooray! But then Bimo tells the gang that literally everyone is dead. Nah, poop. But Bimo does try to fix the remote by hooking it up to their robot heart. Hooray, but it doesn't work. Eh, poop. Oh, and Bimo dies. <laughs> Again. Man, things are not going well. You know, it's times like these in the original series where the only way things could get worse is if the Lich showed up. Oh, come on! So, quick refresher. The Lich is one of the main villains from the original Adventure Time show. Pops up all the time. He's just this evil, monstrous, cosmic entity of death. And this dimension is one where he succeeded in his ultimate goal of eradicating all life on Earth. But you know, with no more life on the planet, dude's got nothing else to do. He's just kind of bummed out, so he's actually not a threat for once. And of course, with all life eradicated and the remote still busted, Fiona, Cake, and Simon are yeah, they're pretty much toast. So reluctantly, Fiona reveals the crown. Yeah, while exploring the remains of what used to be the Ice Kingdom with Bimo, Fiona and Cake found some old home videos of the Ice King. And not only did Fiona find out where the Ice King hid the crown through these tapes, she also saw how miserable Simon was as the Ice King. So she did grab the crown, hoping Simon wouldn't have to use it, but there's no more options. Simon takes the crown and uses the magic of the Lich to reopen the portal in the back of his head so Fiona and Kate can jump back into their world. But once they're back and safe, the Scarab appears ready to strike. But then the Lich hijacks Simon's spell, opening another portal that leads to Golb. Betty. Gold Betty. It's Golb, but it's Betty. They just call her Gold Betty, and I don't, I don't like it. And the Lich is like, I am. So bored. Please tell me my new purpose. But then Golbetti turns him into a Tetris block. So he's dead, I guess? You can never really be sure with that one. But with him out of the way, Simon can finally try and talk to Betty. He tells her all about Fiona and Cake and his plan to become the Ice King again and save their world. But uh, Go Betty is not having it. Remember, Betty spent multiple seasons of the original show trying to turn the Ice King back into Simon. That's why she's Gob in the first place. So to stop him, she zaps Simon to another universe where his consciousness takes over... Shermy? The silly little rabbit guy we only ever saw at the very, very end of the Adventure Time finale? Man, they're really pulling out all the obscure Adventure Time lore for this one. While Simon figures out how to navigate all of that, his real body is still frozen back with Golbetti. Just in time for the Scarab, who's also there, to wake up, see the portal to Fiona and Cake's world still open in the back of Simon's head, and finally take his chance to kill Simon and eradicate the rogue universe. But of course, Golbetti's not gonna let that happen. She splits the Scarab into a bunch of tiny little Scarab beetles, but while that might have saved Simon, it doesn't stop the beetles from crawling through through the portal and invading Fiona and Cake's world. Things go wrong very quickly. The Scarab Beetles overrun Fiona and Cake's world and soon reform into the full-fledged Scarab, who then starts wreaking absolute havoc, zapping bits of the world completely out of existence. Fiona, Cake, and Gary and Marshall, who are actually dating now, huh? 
Who could have seen that coming? All try to fight back, but the Scarab is just too powerful. And seeing her world just crumbling around her, Fiona realizes that she doesn't want this world to be changed and turned magical. She wants the world she's had this whole time and she's willing to fight for it so that everyone she knows and loves can either live or die as themselves. Meanwhile, Simon, as Shermie, finds a book on ancient artifacts that that Dimensions version of Simon wrote, which uh, weirdly takes the form of a choose your own adventure video game book gun thing, and the story is basically a complete allegory for Simon and Betty's relationship. And in playing the game, Simon realizes how often Betty sacrificed things in her life to be with Simon, and how he never really did the same for her. This revelation zaps Simon back into his own body, where he apologizes to Betty and realizes that his life isn't meaningless like he believed before. And with that, Simon's phone rings, and Fiona tells him everything that's going on in her world. Simon nearly puts on the crown to try and help, but Fiona says, no. Simon doesn't know what to do, so in a fit of rage, he throws the crown into the abyss. But then, uh, he, he burps out a dandelion. Okay. This is Fiona's world, apparently. And he just kind of like knows that. He just is like instinctively, he's just like, oh, Fiona's world. What? It's a dandelion and it's pink. And Simon sends the dandelion through his head portal to Fiona. This all sounds so weird when you just have to write it out like this. Fiona makes a wish and blows on the dandelion, spreading its petals all across town. Mirroring this, Betty then picks up Simon and sends him flying back off to his own universe. And all of this, whether it was Go Betty or the dandelion wish or whatever, has actually made Fiona's world legit. It was no longer an unauthorized authorized rogue dimension, it's now part of the multiverse. So all of the Scarab's damage just up and reversed itself. But at this point, Scarab doesn't really care. Authorized or not, he just wants to burn this universe to the ground. But back at the time room, Prismo finally breaks out of that little cube prison he was in and sees what's happening in Fiona's world. So he sends in a cavalry of every single friend Fiona and Cake made across the multiverse to help them fight, including this little squirrel guy with magic fruit from episode three, who I totally forgot to mention. <laughs> the magic fruit makes Fiona grow 100 feet tall, and she uses that strength to absolutely squash the Scarab. Their friends then steal the Scarab's weapon and toss it up to Cake, who then uses it to trap the Scarab in this weird little egg thing. And finally, the day is saved. Everyone helps rebuild Fiona's world after all the chaos. The Scarab gets sentenced to become Prismo's apprentice in the time room, and they kind of become friends, I think. And Simon gets a new lease on life back in his own universe. They even show him actually in therapy. Love that for him. And that is Adventure Time Fiona and Cake. This is the best thing Adventure Time's ever done. No joke, I think this is the best, most well-crafted story that has ever come out of the Adventure Time franchise. And the best part is that it uses every single bit of the show's history to do it. Seriously, how many other shows are able to be at the top of their game like this more than a decade after their premiere? It blows my mind. And if this is the note that Adventure Time finally ends on after 13 years, they would be ending on an amazing high note. But eh, who am I kidding? The next three seasons, five spinoffs, and new mobile game tie-ins have probably already been announced by the time this video even goes up. How am I supposed to pretend you're not over if you never leave? Amphibia. I have been dying to make a video on this cartoon, man. Amphibia is by far one of the best shows to come from Disney Channel recently. And considering their lineup, that's saying something. But if I'm talking about it, that can only mean one thing. The show's over. And I'm about to get up here and spoil the whole dang thing with some stupid drawings. As usual, there's a lot to cover and I ain't trying to make an hour long video. So I do gotta oversimplify some things. These recaps are not a replacement for watching the actual show. Please, if you like this video, go watch Amphibia. It's on Disney Plus. Trust me, it'll be a much different experience than watching this video. But with all that said, this is everything you need to know about Amphibia. Frog show. So Amphibia is all about this girl named Anne Boon Choi, who, along with her friends Sasha Waybright and Marcy Wu, get magically transported to another dimension full of giant talking frog people. This is how the show begins. They were sent to Amphibia through this crazy looking music box they found at a pawn shop. But apparently, a travel by music box portal isn't very reliable because all three of them landed in totally different parts of Amphibia. And what's worse, after arriving, the music box loses power. See those stones? See how they lost their color? Yeah. 
box don't work no more. Leaving Anne stuck in another dimension to fend for herself, completely and utterly alone. Oh, hey, look, frogs. These are the planters, Polly, Sprig, and Hop Pop. They're a farm family from the nearby town of Ortwood. Polly's a little tadpole who's got a lot of attitude for someone with no legs. Sprig's an excitable troublemaker, and Hop Pop is their responsible grandpa who's voiced by Goofy. I'm old, I'm elderly. Anne runs into Sprig in the middle of the woods. They fight a giant praying mantis. Anne's eyes glow blue for a second. That's that's weird. They survive, and the planters take Anne in to help her find her friends and get home. Anne then gives the planters the rundown on how she wound up in Amphibia in the first place, even handing the music box over to Hop Pop. And at first, he's like, eh. But when Anne's not looking, he's like, yeah. Yeah. So apparently, Hop Pop did some research and found out this music box is incredibly dangerous. I mean, it's literally called the Calamity Box. Naturally, Hop Pop freaks out and buries that thing in the front yard, covering his tracks by telling Anne that he sent it to some contacts of his to get more information. I'm sure this will end well. But besides all that, this first season mostly follows Anne just getting used to life in Amphibia, bonding with the planters, going on adventures, and putting the citizens of Wartwood in mortal danger on a regular basis. That is until, <gasps> look, it's Sasha. I found her. D d do we, uh, are we supposed to kill her or? So yeah, Anne reunites with one of her human friends, Sasha. She's a popular kind of mean girl type who has a history of bossing her friends around to get her way. It's complicated, but for Anne, it's just nice to know that she's alive. Wait, is that an army of toads? Yeah, so when Sasha landed in Amphibia, she was found and captured by the Toad Army. They're a sort of tyrannical law enforcement in Amphibia, kind of meant to keep the frogs in line. At first, Sasha was their prisoner, but managed to impress them enough to eventually become second in command to their leader, Captain Grime, who looks Pleasant. So, toads hate frogs, Sasha's working for the toads, Anne's friends with the frogs, naturally there's gonna be a little conflict here. Like, I don't know, trapping the people of Wartwood inside the toad army's tower and planning to feed Hop Pop to a giant carnivorous plant because they think he's leading a rebellion. Yeah. Yeah, this is that oversimplifying part I was talking about. Yeah, Hop Hop ran for mayor against a toad at one point and lost, but apparently challenging toad authority turned him into some kind of revolutionary figurehead. I don't know. All that matters is the frogs are trapped and Anne is super mad at Sasha for putting her friends in danger. But Sasha's like, dude, they're slimy little creatures. Who cares? Stop being annoying. Yeah, remember how I said Sasha liked to boss Anne around? We really get a look at how toxic their friendship is here. Anne says, no. Sasha's like, what? And Anne's like, uh-oh. Anne and Sasha leap into an intense sword fight atop Toad Tower, but uh-oh, the tower's exploding. Don't ask. The ground starts to crumble beneath Sasha and she nearly plummets to her death. Anne tries to help, but Sasha willingly lets herself fall, saying Anne's better off without her. She falls, but is saved just in time by Captain Grime. That rhymed. That rhymed. So Sasha didn't die, and she and the Toad army are forced into hiding after, you know, imprisoning an entire town and trying to kill an innocent grandpa. Which brings us to season two. This time around, the gang's on a road trip to visit the King of Amphibia and see if he can help Anne get home. His name is Andreas. He rules in a big city called Newtopia and he's real tall. Long story short, the gang makes it all the way to Newtopia and finds Marcy. Yeah. yeah, apparently when the music box tossed her into Amphibia, she landed right in Newtopia and befriended King Andreas. Marcy's an excitable nerd who has somehow managed to learn everything about everything in Amphibia in just a couple months. Heck, she's even a Newtopian knight now. So she takes the gang to meet Andreas and we get some more info on that music box. Apparently this thing is an ancient Amphibian artifact used to visit other worlds. And all they gotta do to get it working again is visit three temples to charge up the three stones on top of the box. But of course, in order to do that, they first gotta get the box back from Hop Pop's contact. Oh. Oh, this is where that not ending well happens. Anne finds out that Hop Pop buried the box in their yard and has been lying to her for months. Will Anne be able to forgive Hop Pop for his betrayal? Yes. Well, Okay, it's more complicated than that. It's here we get some backstory on Polly and Sprig's parents, how they were killed by these giant birds, and how Hop Pop blames himself for not being there to save them. And he explains to Anne that ever since that happened, he's just done anything he could to protect his family. So when he found out the music box was dangerous, he panicked and got rid of it. And he apologized to Anne for lying. Anne accepts his apology, and even though it takes a while, she learns to trust Hop Pop again. So with the heavy stuff out of the way, the gang takes the music box and explore some temples, which goes, ah! 
smoothly. Marcy's eyes glowed green for a second, that's weird, and they charge up the first two stones along the way. Meanwhile, Sasha's been working with the Toads to lead a rebellion against Andreas, her eyes glowed pink for a second, that's weird, and King Andreas is talking to a large multi-eyed creature about revenge. I'm sure that's nothing to worry about. And look, Anne and the gang just made it to the final temple. Uh-oh. Yep, it's time for an unexpected reunion as Sasha and Grimes show up to the temple to make amends. Mm-hmm, sure. The last stone gets charged up and they all return to Newtopia where I'm sure no one will double cross anyone. Sasha betrays Anne by overthrowing King Andreas, who then betrays pretty much everyone by revealing he plans to use the music box to destroy other worlds, and Marcy betrays Anne and Sasha by revealing she basically got them all stuck in Amphibia on purpose because her parents were gonna move, she didn't want to be separated from her friends, and she just happened to read about and find the Calamity Box all on the same day. Yeah, that's, uh... That, that's a lot to take in. It's safe to say everyone's pretty uncomfortable, but no time for awkward silence. We gotta do something about Andreas. It's time for a fight. Huh, would you look at that? Andreas attacks with his army of robot guards and it's uh, it's not going great. Especially not for Sprig who just gets tossed right out a window. <laughs> might be a good time to remind everyone that this castle is currently floating miles above the ground. So, uh, not liking Sprig's chances here. And naturally, Anne is so shocked and heartbroken over this that she channels the energy of the Blue Calamity Stone and suddenly gains insane otherworldly superpowers. What's up? Yeah, you heard me. Superpowers. Anne launches into the air and starts beating up Andreas, but then she's like... Apparently these superpowers don't last forever. So Anne's in trouble, but while she was fighting Andreas, Marcy got to work. She managed to save Sprig by calling a surprise, surprise giant bird, and then stole the music box and opened a portal back to Earth so everyone could escape. Anne, Sprig, Polly, and Hop Pop all jump into the portal and Marcy's just about to follow them when... King Andreas kills Marcy, literally stabbing her in the back. And Anne's like, oh no, my friend, dead. Okay, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I can't really joke about this part, can I? This is legit the most shocking moment I have ever seen in a family cartoon, Disney or otherwise. We just had a brutal on-screen murder in cold blood on the Disney Channel. But before we can even process what's happened, the portal closes, sending Anne and the Planters to the human world. That's right, in a matter of minutes, everything about the show has changed, and we've reached season three, Amphibia's final season. Anne and the planters are stuck in the human world, Sasha's still trapped in Amphibia, Andreas is wreaking havoc, and Mar Mar Marcy dead. So Anne and the planters spend about half the season in LA, hanging out with Anne's parents, avoiding a killer robot sent to, uh, ooh. Hanging with Anne's parents, avoiding a killer robot sent by Andreas, as well as this FBI agent named Mr. X, who wants to capture the giant talking frog people that just showed up on Earth, and is also just straight up RuPaul. Like, no subtlety. They got RuPaul for this character, so they, they, they made this character RuPaul. And while all of this is going on, the gang still has to find a way back to Amphibia without the music box. Luckily, they befriended a museum curator named Dr. Jan and this scientist named Terry, who didn't run away at the first sign of giant talking frog people and agreed to help them out. Miraculously, this team is actually able to build a working portal machine. And with the help of Anne's new blue energy powers, they're able to open up a portal and return to Amphibia. Oh God. What happened here? Well, unsurprisingly, that's all Andreas. Ever since Anne left Amphibia, he's been growing his robot armies, preparing to invade Earth, and absolutely wrecking Amphibia in the process. All the while, Sasha has turned over a new leaf, for real this time, and is working with Grime to form a resistance group to take back Amphibia. Not for the Toads, but for the people. Anne and the Planters join the resistance and start recruiting more teams to join their forces. And also, while exploring their secret headquarters located underneath the Planter house, Sprig finds this mysterious blank letter. And he's like, wow, this is garbage. I'ma keep it for no reason. Blech. I'm sure that won't be important later. So anyway, Sasha and Anne are back together. What about Marcy? I mean, yeah, last we saw of her, she was dabbling in being murdered, but hey, maybe you can recover from a massive flaming fatal stab wound to the torso. You don't know. Oh look, there she is, safe and sound, clinging to life in an ominous stasis pod underneath Andreas's castle. I told you she was fine, but this, 
that definitely isn't normal. Andreas clearly needs Marcy for something, which brings us all the way back to that giant monster he was talking to last season. This is the core, a giant artificial hive mind made up of all the smartest amphibian ancestors' memories smushed into one, including Andreas's very strict and controlling dad. <sighs> Fine, I'll start the flashback. So, long ago, when Andreas was just a prince, he was close friends with this frog named Girl Sprig. Uh, uh, no, sorry, Leaf. Her name was Leaf. She's upbeat, adventurous, and definitely not a distant relative to the planters. She just looks exactly like Sprig for, I don't know, tax benefits? One day, Andreas was showing Leaf the Calamity Box. And for context, this box was very important to Amphibia back then. Using it to conquer other worlds allowed Newtopia to be insanely technologically advanced. It was like the backbone of their entire way of life. But as Leaf was checking it out, she accidentally pressed all three stones and somehow had this crazy vision of the moon crashing into Amphibia, Majora's Mask style. And she was like, hey, I think using this box is gonna kill everyone. But the king was like, but iPad and war. Dude, really? Ugh, forget it. Yoink! Leaf steals the box, runs away, and hides the box on Earth so no one would ever find it. Er, well, we know how that worked out. And when she returned to Amphibia, she started a new life outside of Newtopia and under a new name, Lily Planter. And the rest is, eh, whatever. Meanwhile, Andreas' dad was like, son, you goofed it, and I'm not proud of you. Oh man. Andreas held an insane grudge against Leaf ever since then, making it his life's goal to get the box back and make things up to his dad, who's now part of the core, and this flashback is over, so the core is a big bad thing. But what does that have to do with Marcy? Well, the core needs a host, a body it can inhabit in order to enact its plans. And guess who Andreas brought as a sacrifice? Yep. The core takes control of Marcy via this creepy helmet, absorbing her mind into the core, taking over her body, and creating the new villain, Darcy. You know, like Dark Marcy. That, 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 that right there is gonna make some things complicated. <laughs> but soon, the day of Andreas' invasion of Earth finally arrives and the Resistance is ready. A full-on war breaks out between the Resistance fighters and Andreas' robot armies. And I ain't talking about an Adventure Time war where everyone just meets on the battlefield and then goes to sleep. This, we get like actual fighting here. All the while, our heroes sneak into Andreas' floating castle and steal the music box. Hooray! What? Wait, why, why are you looking at me like that? Of course, Darcy captures them and now plans to kill Anne, sever her connection with the music box and restore its full power. But Anne's like, wait, would that even work? And Darcy's like, dang it, you're right, hold on. So, you know, Anne bought herself some time, but that doesn't stop Darcy and Andreas from opening a portal and invading Earth. But the gang jumps in after them and enters the final, final fight. Andreas and Darcy start invading Anne's hometown with an army of robots, spaceships, and even the giant birds that killed Sprig and Polly's parents. Just rub the salt into that wound. And it's up to our heroes to get them to knock it off. But they're not alone. Anne's parents join the fight, having gone through FBI training with Mr. X, who's not trying to hunt them down anymore. Plus there's Dr. Jan, Terry, and a bunch of other people who I didn't have time to talk about. Anne activates her powers and squares off with Andreas. She puts up a dang good fight, but eventually her powers give out and she collapses. However, she's revived by, and I'm not joking here, Black Pink the K-pop group. Anne's family blasts their song as if it's your last over the loudspeakers and it jolts Anne back to full power. <laughs> it is amazing, but doesn't last forever as her powers give out again. So Andreas is about to kill Anne when Sprig leaps in to save the day. Using Mr. X's fancy FBI glasses, Mr. X misdirect. Oh, <gasps> oh. Was that on purpose? Using Mr. X's fancy FBI glasses, Sprig discovers a secret message written to Andreas on that random letter he found. It's a letter from Leaf to Andreas explaining that even after everything that happened between them, she always carried fond memories of Andreas and hoped that moving forward, he wouldn't close himself off to others, which, you know, he did. Reflecting on everything, Andreas breaks down crying. But up in the castle, Darcy sees this and is like, Ugh but they can only scold Andreas for so long because there's a Sasha there trying to fight him. Oh, and Grime too. He got his arm chopped off. It was a whole thing. But while Darcy was yelling at Andreas for having feelings, Sasha snuck up behind and slashed the cable connecting the core to Marcy. The helmet shuts down, the core goes offline, and Marcy is free, just in time for Andreas to give up the fight and get absolutely obliterated by Anne's final attack. Apparently he was part robot the whole time. 
You would have thunk. But that's it, right? The gang saves Earth and returns to Amphibia to celebrate? Oh, no, 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 no. Because the core is still active. The helmet straight up grows these creepy legs, flies to the moon, and starts piloting it to crash into Amphibia in a last ditch effort to come out on top. So, so yeah, Leaf, Leaf's uh, prediction was right, just maybe not in the way they thought. But whatever, look, danger. And it's up to Anne and Sasha and Marcy to stop it. Yes. Using the power of the stones, Sasha and Marcy receive superpowers of their own and they all fly off to have a crazy anime fight against uh, the moon, I guess. <laughs> Calling it an anime fight kind of sounds like a joke, but no, Marcy straight up calls it an anime thing. The show just runs with it and it's animated so well, like good Lord, but it's not enough. It, not the animation, the, the trying to stop the moon. Even after Andreas redeems himself by sending his robot armies to help, uh, the moon can't be stopped, leaving Anne with no other choice. See, Anne, Sasha, and Marcy get their powers from their matching stones, blue, pink, and green. But Anne could channel the energy of all three stones at once, giving her power so insane that it would basically be an instant win. But doing so would kill her. And the choice for Anne was easy. She sends Sasha and Marcy back to Amphibia, calls upon the power of all three stones, and eradicates the moon, giving her own life to save her friends. And then things get weird. Anne wakes up on a floating island where she meets an all-knowing, all-seeing cosmic entity who takes the form of her pet cat. Very normal. This entity then offers Anne the chance to take their place and basically become a god. And Anne's like, yeah, no. But because this entity can see the potential in Anne, they send her back to continue her life. Thus, reviving Anne in just the most insane way possible. Where'd all that come from? But with Anne back, she and her friends say their goodbyes, use the music box one final time, and head home never to return. Yeah, they never go back to Amphibia. Everyone moves on with their lives, but no one forgets how their time in Amphibia shaped who they became. And that is the end of Amphibia. You know, the Funny Frog Show. I gotta be real, I was not expecting the show about silly frogs to ever involve betrayal, war, superpowers, and so much death. What an unbelievable cartoon, man. Probably my new favorite from the Disney Channel. I'm serious. But there's still one question left unanswered. How's Amphibia gonna survive without a moon? What effects will this have on the planet's ecosystem? Is there a backup moon? What's controlling the tides? Are the water levels in Amphibia rising? All right, let's see, what to recap. Hmm. Star versus the forces of evil? Uh, nah, not now. Avatar? Uh, still haven't seen it. Steven Universe? Uh, maybe I can squeeze a few more videos out of that, but nah. Hmm. Ugh, screw it. I just want to talk about the Owl House. So, if you don't know, the Owl House is one of the latest hit cartoons to come out of the Disney Channel. It's a fantasy, comedy, adventure, slice of life thing in the same vein as Gravity Falls and Star vs. the Forces of Evil. And it is really good. I mean, it's only one season in, but I'm already hooked. And since we don't really know when a season two is coming, I figured why not go ahead and recap everything that's happened so far? You know, for fun. This is everything you need to know about the Owl House so far. So the Owl House is all about this girl named Luce. She's a quirky nerd with an overactive imagination that always gets her in trouble. In fact, the first time we see her, she's in the principal's office for accidentally letting a bunch of snakes loose at school. And her mom is just tired of it. So she's shipping her off to a summer camp to make her normal. Top tier parenting right there. Kid too creative? Are they too happy? Just make them someone else's problem for a while and when they get back, they'll have the personality of a plank of wood. Good job! But while Luce waits for the bus to camp, out of nowhere, this random owl snatches one of her things and runs off with it. In the middle of the day! Weird. She chases the owl into this abandoned, rundown house, goes through this really creepy looking door, and somehow is transported to a crazy fantasy realm. Huh. Wow. That was fast. This is the Boiling Isles, a magical realm built from the remains of a titan, also known as just like a really tall dude. All the stuff we consider fantasy junk on Earth, yeah, all that's real in the Boiling Isles. Fairies, griffins, demons, witches, and more. Speaking of witches, while Luce is still freaking out of her somehow jumping dimensions, she meets a witch named Ida the Owl Lady. Ida's a bit of a scam artist, sending her pet owl to the human world through this fold up portal door to collect garbage she can sell to people in the Boiling Miles. She's also wanted by the police. Is a fun fact for you. So when Luce draws a crowd to Ida's little flea market booth, a cop shows up to arrest her. But Ida's like, ha, nah, dude, it's episode one. I ain't getting caught. And speeds off, taking Luce with her. They soon wind up at Ida's house. You know, 
The Owl House. Where Luce meets Ida's roommate. The ferocious, the evil, the king of demons. He's just a tiny little baby. Ida and Luce make a deal. Ida will help Luce get back home if she helps them break into a prison called the Conformatorium to steal back King's crown. It's not like Luce has any other options, so she agrees they get inside the prison, find King's, uh... Burger King crown, freaking clickbait, start a prison riot and escape in one piece. Ida keeps up her half of the deal and opens a portal to send Luce home. But uh, uh, given the choice between an awesome fantasy world where she can be herself and a boring summer camp that will literally erase all her personality, Luce makes the pretty obvious choice to stay in the Boiling Isles. Which is good, because if she hadn't, we wouldn't have a show. So now Luce is living in the Owl House, while lying to her mom that she's at summer camp because apparently there are cell towers that connect between realms. She's working for Ida, learning to become a witch, and finding out that the fantasy life ain't all it's cracked up to be. Yeah, Luce's excitement over her magical fantasy life goes south pretty fast since Ida's not really holding up her end of the bargain. Instead of teaching Luce about magic, she's mostly just giving her odd jobs and chores. Rip off artist! Oh, my so in the meantime, Luce goes exploring and makes a couple friends, Willow and Gus. These two are students at Hexide School of Magic and Demonics. Yep, we got a wizard school on our hands. Willow and Gus sneak Luce around the school, cause she's not really supposed to be there, and of course, hijinks ensue and Luce is banned from Hexide by the end of the day. And Ida loves that. We already know she's a bit of a rebel, but she really hates this witch school and the entire magic Industry? Is that the right word? See, in the Boiling Isles, there are these things called covens. They're basically your majors in magic school. The specialty you choose to dedicate your magic powers to. Sounds cool. But when you choose a coven, all your other magic is locked away. That is, unless you make it into the fancy pants emperor's coven. Ida hates all that, so she never joined a coven. Which is a big no-no. That's why the cops are always after her. She's sticking it to the man, man. And then there's Lilith. Lilith is the leader of the Emperor's Coven, a super powerful witch, and Ida's sister. Being the head of the Emperor's Coven, she's the one in charge of hunting down Ida. She's always trying to catch her, arrest her, and convince her to just join the Emperor's Coven already. So yeah, they don't get along. It's pretty easy to see why Ida hates all this coven stuff. But even with all that, she still hasn't done much to teach Luce any magic herself. Well, at least... Not directly. See, one of the few times Ida reluctantly decided to actually teach Luce something, she was like, ugh, fine, just make a circle in the air using the power stored inside the gross green sack attached to your heart and boom. But I don't have a green sack attached to my- Don't care, goodbye, going to sleep forever. <laughs> well, that was a bust. Oh God, giant monster! So yeah, fun fact? Ida's cursed! She doesn't remember why. All she knows is that she has to take her medicine or else... Yeah. So while Luce is dealing with that, she discovers that even though humans have no magic ability, she can cast spells of her own using an ancient method called... Drawing... Ooh. By drawing these glyphs, Luce can actually do magic, and no one really knows how it works. But she just happens to learn this handy dandy new skill just in time to turn Ida back to normal. Hooray! Ida's not an owl beast anymore, King still hasn't done much for the overall plot, and Luce is finally learning to become a witch. But there's another witch in training who's not too keen on Luce's antics. Introducing... Amity. She's the top student at Hexide, and she has had Luce on her crap list ever since she got banned from school. At least, that's how it started. After learning more about each other through several near-death experiences, Amity and Luce start to see more eye to eye. Eventually, Luce learns that Amity is just under a lot of pressure to live up to unrealistic expectations, Amity learns that Luce is just trying to find her way in this crazy new world, and eventually, they become friends, which is nice, but I mean, they don't really see each other a ton. It's not like they go to the same school or anything. Hey kid, I don't really know what I'm doing, so uh, you're going to school now, okay, bye. Okay, sure. Ida went down to Hexide, spoke to the principal, got the ban lifted, somehow didn't get arrested in the process, and now Luce is going to witch school. Hooray, school is cool. Ugh. Being at Hexide's going all right for Luce. Or, well, it's a cartoon about magic school, so obviously going all right means constantly getting in trouble, fighting off monsters, and nearly dying on a weekly basis. You know, 
high school, but then Grom comes around. Grom is Hexide's version of prom. There's music and dancing and a fight to the death between one chosen student and a monster that manifests itself as their greatest fears. You know, high school. And this year, the chosen student is Amity. Oh boy. Well, at least we got to know her a bit before she dies. Actually, Luce decides to take Amity's place and face her own fear instead. And this goes okay, until it doesn't. The Grom monster takes the form of Luce's mom scolding her over lying about going to camp, and Luce just can't confront it. But then Amity steps in to save Luce from Grom. The monster shapeshifts to become Amity's biggest fear, and all it does is take a piece of paper out of her pocket and rip it up. The paper read, will you go to Grom with me? Luce sees this and was like, aw, you were afraid of getting rejected, you stupid idiot. And then the two defeat Grom together through the power of dance. So everything was fine in the end. But wait, the other half of Amity's note has become unfolded. The entire note reads, Loose, will you go to Grom with me? So while the fandom freaks out over that, let's pop back over to Ida. While Luce is going to school, learning magic, and making friends, Ida's struggling. Her curse is getting worse. It takes more elixirs and more of Ida's own magic to keep the Owl Beast at bay. Lilith keeps telling her that if she just joins the Emperor's Coven, the Emperor could heal the curse himself. But uh, <laughs> yeah. That's a no-go. Then one day, Luce and her friends take a field trip to the Emperor's castle right around the same time Lilith barges into said castle after another failed attempt to arrest Ida. Luce follows her to the Emperor's room and this place, this place is creepy, man. There's a giant green heart pumping over the throne and as Lilith approaches, the Emperor is struggling to breathe. But then he cracks open whatever this is, pours hot soup in his eyes and he's suddenly better. This is normal. Very normal. But yeah, this is Emperor Bellows. 50 years ago, he rose to power claiming that he could speak to the Titan that birthed the Boiling Isles and said everyone was doing magic wrong. They were all using magic freely, like Ida. But Bellows was like, heh, 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 no. So he created the coven system and punished anyone who didn't fall in line. Emperor Bellows promised to heal Ida's curse if Lilith can arrest her and bring her to him. But if Lilith fails, she'll be fired and treated like a criminal. So while Luce is sneaking around the castle, Lilith attacks and takes her hostage to draw Ida out. The two then meet at the castle for a duel. They're flying through the air, teleporting, zapping each other all pew, 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 and it's really cool. But then Lilith's like, oh, by the way, that curse that ruined your life? Yeah, that was me. I did that, and I feel bad about it, but eh, I'm gonna throw your kid off a cliff now. <laughs> so that's a thing now. Truth's out, Ida's furious, and Luce is falling to her death. And flashback time. So way back when Ida and Lilith were kids, they were training at Hexide. And for their final exam, they'd have to battle each other to decide who would enter the Emperor's Coven. But Lilith knew Ida was better than her. So she put a curse on her that she thought would stop her powers for a day. Instead, it just turned her into a giant owl beast. Ida didn't even want to join the Coven. You didn't have to do any of this, but Oh well, this is reality now. Ida is now forever cursed for no good reason, and Lilith just takes her place at the Emperor's Coven. Flash forward back to the action. Luce is still falling to her death, but Ida quickly casts a spell to save her, using up the last of the magic, keeping her from permanently becoming the Owl Beast. All right, cool. So we all hate Lilith now, right? We're in agreement here? Sick. But the Emperor promised to heal Ida, right? That's why Lilith's been doing all this. Well, guess what? Bellos lied, refuses to heal Ida, and now he's gonna turn her into petrified stone and force everyone to watch. Whoopsies! Oopsie poopsies! Luce and King manage to infiltrate the castle and find Ida, who comes to her senses long enough to give Luce the portal to the human realm and tell her to go home. Ida is then carted away to be petrified. Big poopy. But then Lilith shows up and asks to work with Luce to make things right. Big poopy? But of course, the emperor immediately captures them. Big poopy. Bellos makes Luce a deal. He'll let Luce go to save her friends in exchange for the portal to the human realm. We don't really know why he wants it yet, but it's probably for bad reasons. But Luce agrees, only to pull a fast one on the emperor, using her magic to rig the portal to explode, stopping the emperor's plans, but destroying her only way back home. Luce then stops the petrification, escapes with her friends, and heads back to the Owl House. Lilith redeems herself by casting a spell to give herself half of Ida's curse, which turns Ida back to normal, 
but her magic's still gone. But hey, now Luce gets to teach Ida how to do all that cool paper magic stuff. Everyone is safe, and they all lived happily ever after. For now? Yeah, all this was just season one. The Emperor still has some tricks up his sleeve. It all has to do with something called the Day of Unity and this giant machine he's building out of the remains of Ida's portal door. Plus, Luce's mom keeps getting all of these letters from Luce at camp that she definitely isn't sending. So even though so much has already happened in just this one season, the Owl House is just getting started. But I can't help but feel like I've forgotten something. I've covered every major plot point across all the episodes. I got most of the big cliffhangers, but I just feel like something's missing. Ah! I forgot Hootie! How could you forget about the best character in the show, Hoot Hoot? I protect the house, I'm a magical beast. I'm okay, really long. I maybe really I should have just done another really Steven Universe long. video. And we're back. Back to what you ask? Why, back to the ongoing plot recap of the Disney Channel animated series, The Owl House video series. Whatever. Yep, it's time to revisit The Owl House, the Disney Channel cartoon about a teenage girl getting lost in another dimension. But not the one with frogs. Or the one about racism. I recapped season one of this show last year, and now that season two's wrapped up, it's time for me to regurgitate everything I saw back to you guys, but with far worse drawings and explanations and everything else. As always, things are definitely gonna be oversimplified here. If you want the full Owl House experience, Watch the Owl House. These recaps are basically cartoon cliff notes, just keep that in mind. So first, where'd we leave off in season one? Well, for a full deep dive into that, there's my season one recap. But basically, a girl named Luz trips into a world of magic, learns to cast spells with paper, and meets an owl lady named Ida who becomes her new mom. And King is also there. New mom Ida hates the emperor, Bellos, because he makes everyone join something called a coven, which means they can only practice one kind of magic, indicated by the sigil they all get branded with. Also, Bellos sometimes has heart palpitations that nearly turn him into a giant monster, and he has to consume the essence of these things called palismen to stop it. This normal is the most normal, and new mom Ida also turns into a monster sometimes because her sister Lilith was mean. But after fighting for a while, they make up and decide to share the curse equally. Then Luz fights Bellows because he's evil and doing evil things. He keeps going on about some stupid day of unity and it's annoying. So she beats him up, but blows up her only way home in the process. Oops. Okay, season one mini recap over. Now it's season two and Lilith is just crashing at the owl house, repairing her relationship with Ida, getting used to her new curse, and befriending that big owl worm thing that lives in their walls, Hootie. They seem to be getting along. Lilith and Ida are struggling without their magic, but Luce is teaching them to use glyphs. Luce herself is basically the same as always, going on adventures, learning new spells, trying to find a way home, and definitely not super obviously crushing on her former rival Amity. All that blushing is just, because of allergies. Meanwhile, Bellos is rebuilding the portal to the human realm and preparing for the Day of Unity, which is kind of the big, bad, ticking clock of the season. But besides the Day of Unity, the main focus of this season is Luce's attempts to get back to the human realm. And I mean, yeah, I, that's kind of always been the point. But things actually start to pick up steam when Luce gets tipped off to an interesting fact. She's not the only human to have visited the Boiling Isles. So she meets up with Amity and the two go digging at the local library where they discover ancient diary logs in a mouse skeleton. It doesn't matter. This was the diary of a human named Philip Witterbane who got lost in the Boiling Isles a long time ago and wrote about the things he learned as he tried to get back home. Almost like, a journal? Okay, I'll stop. But Luce is now one step closer to finding a way home, and she got to spend some time with Amity, who now has purple hair and gives Luce a kiss on the cheek. I swear to God, I've never seen two people blush more in my life. Starting to worry it's some kind of circulatory issue. Luce starts studying as much as she can from Philip's diaries and learns about something called Titan's blood. Yeah, you know those giant skeletal remains this entire civilization is built on? Yeah, that used to be a Titan. They're like gods in the Boiling Isles. And apparently, even just a little bit of their blood is powerful enough to tear the fabric of reality and open portals to other dimensions. But since the Titans are extinct, their blood is extremely rare. And obviously, Bellos is after it too. <laughs> So, uh, to make a long story short, after a series of wacky adventures, people nearly die. Both Luce and Bellos end up with some Titan's blood. Bellos needs it to rebuild the main portal, but Luce decides to build a portal door of her own. It's pretty unstable and not fully functional. She can look into the human realm, but not enter it. So, Luce is able to get a glimpse of home where she finds... Oh! 
Okay, another loose? Well, not really. This is V, a shape-shifting demon from the Boiling Isles who's been living in Luce's place since she's been gone. Yeah, it turns out Luce's mom has had absolutely no idea she's been missing this entire time. Completely unaware. But of course, once she's faced with a... This scenario, some questions had to be asked. Luce's mom finds out about everything. She lets V stay with her, but is naturally heartbroken that Luce chose to stay in the Boiling Isles instead of coming home. And just as the portal starts to fail, Luce promises her mom to come back home and stay. Luce is then pulled back into the Boiling Isles, the portal collapses in on itself, and that is the last she sees of her mom for now. But Luce isn't done hopping into other worlds, now teaming up with Lilith to travel back in time. Luce wants to meet that Philip guy and try to get his help. But of course, he is from a very long time ago. And apparently, time travel is absolutely, definitely something you can do in the Boiling Isles, just no one had ever actually done it until now. Luce and Lilith just out here casually discovering time travel. They hop back in time and manage to find Philip, who's acting a little sketchy, not gonna lie, but he does agree to help Luce if she helps him find this mysterious character he's been looking for, the Collector. So the three of them all head to, well, the Titan's head. Luce and Lilith help Philip, Luce and Lil, <laughs> there's so many L's, why are there so many L's? Luce and Lilith help Philip open this big door and Philip's like, oh, would you look at that? It's time to, uh, t time for, time for me to, uh, it's time, time for the, uh, it's time, time. Betrayal! A giant monster that Philip knew would be there attacks our heroes while Philip just moseys on over to grab this shiny round tablet with a moon on it and dips. Luckily, our heroes escape, Lilith punches Philip in the face, and they head back to their time. Oh, and Philip is definitely Bellows. Look at him. He's eating palismen, hating witches. Yeah, that's Bellows. But Luz doesn't know that yet, so shh, 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 shh. Uh, so, now let's shift focus onto someone who hasn't really had a whole lot of spotlight so far, King, the good old King of Demons. Or at least, that's what he calls himself. He's just a little guy. And how could he have been the king of anything? Well, Lilith and Hootie were thinking the same thing. So, to prove he's not lying, King takes the gang all the way to this castle on a mysterious uncharted island. According to King, this castle is where he ruled over armies and ate glorious feasts. But Ida's like, eh. Yeah, so apparently none of that King of Demons stuff was true. Ida just found King eating bugs in this castle, took him home with her, and made up all the King of Demons stuff to make him happy. So King's life is a lie, but that doesn't explain what he was doing in this castle in the first place. Well, turns out this is where he was born, hatched from an egg and left on his own after hearing the roar of what he believes to have been his dad. King might not be the King of Demons, but there's definitely a lot more to learn about who he really is. And King is now determined to find his dad and get get answers. But speaking of parents, between Luce getting closer to going home and King looking to find his dad, new mom Ida is starting to get kind of nervous. She's really grown to love her little family and now it feels like everyone's trying to leave. So she does what anyone should do in this situation drink the pain away. But after enabling her unhealthy coping mechanism, she runs into a group of rebel bards fighting some of the Emperor's scouts. And if there's one thing that can cheer Ida up, it's sticking it to the Emperor's coven. So she helps the bards escape, only to discover... <gasps> Uh, uh, who is that? This is Rain Whispers. They're actually the head of the Bard Coven, secretly rebelling against the Emperor and his coven system. And they just happen to also be Ida's ex. But they still seem to get along, so, you know, it's fine. It's not weird. Don't make it weird. Ida decides to run with Rain's group of rebels for a bit to stop some of Bellos' plans. He's been arresting a bunch of wild witches and forcing them to join covens for some reason. I mean, that's kind of what he was already doing, but he's doing it harder now. But the bards are caught by two other coven heads, Darius and Eberwolf. Ida nearly sacrifices herself to defeat them, still fearing that her family doesn't need her anymore. But Rain's like, dude, shut up, like actually shut up. And they give themselves over to the coven heads to let Ida escape. Man, the season's been heavy so far. Everyone's got so much to deal with. And with all this happening at once, I know exactly what you're thinking. What about Hootie? That's right, this Mickey Mouse voiced owl worm building thing is finally plot relevant. Woo! See, Hootie sees just how much everyone's going through and decides to help out. But of course, this is Hootie, the dude who barfs in almost every episode he's in. So naturally, it all goes horribly wrong, 
until it doesn't. Completely by accident, Hootie helps King discover that he has supersonic scream powers, he helps Ida come to peace with her curse, unlocking this wicked looking harpy form, and he helps Luz finally ask out Amity. And you know what that means, more blushing. Are you okay? This much blushing can't be healthy, do you need medical assistance? She says yes, obviously, meaning that Luz and Amity are finally an official couple. Hooray! Hootie has served a purpose, and everyone had their status quo changed in one fell swoop. Man, it's like they had to squeeze more of their story into less episodes because Disney wouldn't give them a full third season or something. I don't know. So that's what all the good guys are up to. What about the villains? Well, as we know, Belos is still working on rebuilding the portal and prepping for the Day of Unity with the Collector. We don't know much about him yet, we just know he's super powerful. Though technically he's trapped in that moon tablet, communicating with Belos as a shadow on the wall. And Belos struck a deal with the Collector. He teaches Belos super powerful magic to help with the Day of Unity, and in return, Belos will use some of his Titan's blood to set him free from the tablet. I'm sure he'll keep up his end of the bargain. But it's not just Belos that Luce and the gang have to put up with this season. There's also Belos' nephew and right-hand man, the Golden Guard, aka Hunter. This guy's a pretty consistent thorn in our hero's sides throughout the season, but after a few run-ins with Luce and her friends, you can see him start to question what he's doing, especially as we see how Belos mistreats him and hands him empty promises so he'll do what he's told. Man, so many mysteries with this Belos guy. If only we could find out what he's thinking, like really just travel inside his mind. So Luz travels inside his mind, and she brought Hunter with her. It was an accident. But this gives her a great opportunity to find out more about Belos' plan and show Hunter that he shouldn't trust Belos. The two go exploring through Belos' mind, and we finally get all the answers. First off, the Day of Unity. Belos promised the people of the Boiling Isles that the Day of Unity would purge the world of wild magic and create a new paradise for the worthy. And well... At least half of that's true, but the full story is way more concerning. See, Belos has been working with the Collector on something called a draining spell that he plans to cast on the Day of Unity, which will zap all the power from every witch branded with a coven sigil and wipe out not just all magic, but all life in the Boiling Isles. And all in the name of protecting humanity from evil. So yeah. That's not a good thing. Though it does explain why Bellos dedicated so much of his life to creating the coven system and the bogus stories behind it. It allowed him to easily brand nearly every witch with some kind of sigil. The dude's nothing more than a witch hunter who used snake oil tactics to gain power. Even changing his name to Bellos because Philip kept getting run out of town. And also, let's not ignore this, Belos is old, like way old. Remember, this is the same guy Luce had to discover time travel just to meet. He's been consuming the souls of Palisman as a way of keeping himself alive, but all those Palisman souls jostling around inside of him have warped and corrupted him. So he's always on the verge of transforming into this hideous monster. But that's not all. Hunter sees firsthand how Belos' stories about wild magic hurting his family were all lies to sell people on the coven system. He even faked being attacked by wild witches in front of a crowd of people with the help of, uh, that's the Golden Guard. That's Hunter. And I don't mean they look similar, I mean that is Hunter. But this was a long time ago. How's that work? So yeah, here we find out that Hunter is something called a Grimwalker. Yeah, basically a copy of someone Belos knew a long time ago. And he's not the first. Hunter is just the latest in a long, long, long line of copies. All the others went against Belos at one point or another, so he, uh got rid of them. Hunter learns he's not who he thought he was, Luce learns exactly who Belos is, and the two manage to escape Belos' mind. But now, they're in more danger than ever. Belos knows they were in his mind, so they gotta hide. Hunter leaves the Emperor's Coven and starts hiding out at Hexide School, and Luce just takes a little trip to another mysterious, uncharted place with Hootie and King, where they all meet... Oh, more Kings. Dude, is this King's family? Well, no, unfortunately. These guys are just regular old witches who call themselves Titan Trappers. According to them, though Titans are supposedly extinct, there's still one more out there, and they've dedicated their lives to learning to trap that Titan so they can kill it. You know, mercilessly, and with murder. Heck, they even dress up like Titans to trap it. Huh, well, this has implications. So, King, just a little guy King, is a titan, the last of the titans. Those unfathomably gigantic creatures who are basically the gods of this world? The creatures so powerful that even just a drop of their blood can create interdimensional portals? Yeah, King is uh, one of 
that. And he's currently surrounded by an entire town of people who have dedicated their lives to trapping and killing his kind. Naturally, Lou scoops up King and bolts out of there. Don't worry, she took Hootie too. They all make it back safe and the Owl House has been ransacked. Yeah, uh, the Emperor had the whole place trashed. Luckily, Ida and Lilith were able to escape and everyone eventually reunites. Ida, Lilith, Luce, King, and an entire secret rebellion group. Uh, so, turns out, Rain and their bards are all okay, and the two coven heads that captured them before, Darius and Everwolf, were actually on their side the entire time. Cool! Oh, and there's Steve. He's Steve. These guys all formed a rebellion to stop the Day of Unity, and they've got a plan. See, Belos needs all nine of the Coven Head's magic to power the draining spell. So the group wants Ida, disguised as Rain, to take their place so the Owl Beast curse can corrupt the spell. Which means, after a lifetime of avoiding it, Ida finally had to join a coven and be given a sigil. Meanwhile, Luce finally meets back up with her friends Willow and Gus, plus Hunter, who's now on their side. He's like best friends with Gus, it's cool. And of course, Amity. I kind of feel bad that I've not been talking about her as much. She's been dealing with a lot of her own family stuff this season. Her mom is super controlling, very business oriented, and she's been creating these robots for the Emperor's army. Meanwhile, her dad has just kind of been letting it all happen, even though no one is happy. Eventually, he does kind of talk to Amity and they start to work things out. But the mom, just total lost cause. She knew about everything Bellos was planning. She was just a total, just like, there's, there is definitely a divorce in the future. <laughs> but Luce and Amity finally reunite and even share their first kiss, which isn't an incredibly sweet moment. You can tell it's important because the animation gets fancier. But before too long, Luce gets kidnapped and taken back to Belos' lair. You know, the Titan's head. Belos himself attracts a massive crowd to the Day of Unity ceremony and begins the draining spell. He then quickly zips back to the Titan's head where the collector's like, this is awesome! You're gonna release me now, right? Right? Yeah! Shocker, Bellus doesn't hold up his end of the bargain and straight up tosses the collector's tablet down a chasm. This is also where he put the other hunters when he killed them. You can see their remains, they're all dead down there. And all this just in time for Luce to finally get dropped off at the lair. So once again, it's Luce against Bellos. Meanwhile, at the ceremony, Ida and Rain's plan does work to corrupt the draining spell, until the Coven Heads catch on to their plan and force Rain to take their spot in the spell, allowing it to fully activate, draining all the life and power from any witch branded with a sigil. So fun! Everyone's about to die! But back at the Titan's head, Luce pulls a fast one on Bellos, again, and uses this glove she found straight up just lying around his lair to brand Bellos with a sigil, meaning he's now being affected by his own draining spell. But instead of reversing the spell, he collapses and transforms into that giant gross monster right as Luce's friends show up to help out, including King, who manages to find the Collector's tablet down in that chasm and starts chatting. The Collector immediately recognizes King as a Titan, which means he has the power to set him free. So the two strike a deal. King sets the Collector free if the Collector stops the draining spell. One pinky promise later and the tablet cracks open, unleashing… huh. A guy from FNAF. Okay, seriously, this is the Collector. He's a little kid with the powers of God. He stops Bellos mid-attack like it was nothing. And then with one boop of his forehead, he does this. Uh, I think Bellos is dead. I mean, he just got splattered by an otherworldly cosmic entity with powers beyond comprehension. I. I, I, I don't think you can come back from that. The dude then stops the draining spell with just a wave of his finger, saving millions of lives in a second. But then he gets kind of carried away and starts bending the world around him for fun, putting Luce and her friends in immediate danger. Their only option to make it out alive being Bellos' portal to the human realm. I see where they're going with this. Unfortunately, King wasn't able to escape with the others, leaving him and Ida in the Boiling Isles as Luce, Amity, Hunter, Willow, and Gus all become trapped in the human realm, officially bringing season two to an end. Yep, Luce takes everyone back to her house where she can finally reunite with her mom, and then the credits roll. Yeah, things definitely got a lot more intense this season, and unfortunately, there's just not a whole lot of the Owl House left after this. The upcoming third season is not only gonna be the show's last, but it's not even a full season. It's just three 44-minute specials. But even with the show so close to its end, we've been left on the biggest cliffhanger so far. What is the Collector gonna do to the Boiling Isles? What about King, Ida, Lilith, Rain, all of them? What What's gonna happen in the human realm? What about Hootie? We don't know yet, but what I do know is I wanna watch Bellos get splattered again. Oh man, that is brutal. And here we go. After three years and three seasons, 
Kinda. The hit Disney Channel cartoon, The Owl House, has finally come to an end. This show about a girl named Lou stumbling into a new world of fantasy and adventure, meeting new friends like Ida and King, finding herself and saving the world, was such an amazing experience. Even if Disney wanted to sabotage it every chance it had. I mean, where I live, the finale didn't air on YouTube until 1.30 a.m. Disney, why do you hate this show so much? But. Whatever. The show aired its final episode earlier this month, and as is tradition here, now I gotta recap the whole thing for you guys with some bad jokes and even worse drawings. Now, if you're just tuning in, this is the third and final part in an ongoing series of Owl House recaps. And that means right away we're gonna be getting into massive big boy spoiler territory. So where we leave off in season two? Oh yeah, uh, Luce, Amity, Willow, Gus, and Hunter had all been flung back into the human realm after the events of the Day of Unity, where the evil Emperor Belos teamed up with this cosmic entity called the Collector to cast a dangerous spell that would wipe out everyone in the Boiling Isles. King freed the Collector from this little moon tablet prison. He then absolutely destroyed Bellos with the flick of his finger, and then he started wreaking havoc on the Boiling Isles. Plus, we learned that Bellos used to be this jerk of a human named Philip Wittabane, who Luce accidentally helped when she traveled back in time to talk to him, not knowing that he was Bellos. Oops. We found out that King is actually the last of an ancient race of magical behemoths called Titans, and that the giant Titan corpse that this whole land is built on is actually actually his dad. Fun. Fun times. Luce and Amity shared their first kiss, which Disney that Disney was just so cool about. <laughs> and we found out that Luce's rival turned friend Hunter is actually one in a long line of clones of some dude Bellos used to hunt witches with. Which, I'll just spoil it right now, it was his brother Caleb. It doesn't play too much into the plot of the last few episodes, so it's just, it's his brother. Hunter is a clone of Bellos' brother Caleb. Yeah, uh, yeah, if you're just hopping into this series, you've missed you missed a lot. <laughs> and I mentioned basically all of this last time, but there were two little things that I did miss. First, right before the Day of Unity, Luce actually got her palisman, which are those cute animal things that turn into witch's staffs. But right now, it's just an egg, and it'll only hatch when Luce bonds with it by sharing her innermost desire. But since everything's so tense and chaotic and complicated right now, she doesn't even know what to think. So until then, egg. Oh, uh, and then there's Bellos. You might think this dude would be dead considering his entire physical being was splattered against a wall like one of those sticky hands. But nah, he's just goop now. Living, breathing, goop. And you see this? Yeah, that blink and you miss it moment at the end of the last episode is actually Bellos sneaking his way into the human realm. I, uh... I, I kind of missed that part. And it's not that I just forgot to mention it. I I, I turned the video off by that point. I, <laughs> I just completely missed it. So at the start of season three, Luce is back home for the first time in forever. And she and all of her friends take up shelter at her mom's house. So Luce is finally able to reunite with her mom, Camila, after months of being stuck in the demon realm. Oh, and don't forget, that shape-shifting demon who took Luce's place for a while, V, still there too. She seems to be doing well, again, I'm sorry if you missed everything up to this point. <laughs> There's a lot to keep track of. And even with the whole our home is being destroyed as we speak and we have no way to stop it thing kind of looming over everyone, the gang gets on pretty well in the human realm. They learn about human stuff, they try to build ways back to the demon realm, and Luce comes out to her mama's bye, which is super sweet. But obviously, as much fun as they might be having, they gotta get back to the Boiling Isles. But in order to do that, they'd need Titan's blood, a rare magical substance that is the key to creating portals between realms. Luckily, the shack that Amity, Willow, Gus, and Hunter are staying in just happened to have a map to Titan's blood buried under the floorboards. Yeah, that's uh, that's convenient. <laughs> and after enough digging, Hunter's palisman Flapjack managed to find it. Was that? Oh, right. <laughs> uh, that's another thing I forgot to mention last time. Hunter, the grim walker with no magical powers, got a palisman. Is a cute little cardinal named Flapjack and they're best friends. So with the map to Titan's blood in their hands, the group goes out to investigate, but Hunter stays behind for a minute only to be attacked by evil goop. Yeah, uh, so remember how Bellos got slushied by the collector and then managed to ooze his way back into the human realm? Well, some of his gross goopy self has been hiding out in this shack. And when Hunter touches this goop, Bellos starts to infect his mind, making Hunter see visions of Bellos everywhere and kind of driving him mad. So there's a lot going on, and things kind of reach ahead on Halloween night when the gang all go to a local haunted hayride. Hunter once again sees a vision of Bellos in the distance, and realizing that Bellos must be after the Titan's blood too, he grabs Luce and they go off to investigate on their own, eventually reaching this nifty looking graveyard. This is, this is probably not nothing, nothing possible bad could happen here. No. <laughs> and here, 
here, Belos' possession of Hunter takes full control. Belos as Hunter attacks Luce right as the rest of the gang find out where they ran off to. Which means we've got our first big fight scene of the season. And it's got the fancy animation too. If Flapjack does their best to help in the fight, but Belos just grabs them and cracks them open without a second thought. Just freaking jerk, mean to birds. And this is the last straw. Hunter manages to regain control of himself long enough to grab the Titan's blood and toss it into a nearby lake. But Bellos takes back over and dives head first after it, nearly drowning Hunter. That is until Camila just jumps right in too, bringing Hunter back to the surface like a freaking hero. Bellos finally ejects himself from Hunter's body, grabs the Titan's blood, and just pieces out back to the demon realm. But Hunter is left barely clinging to life. That is until Flapjack, still heavily injured, flies in and sacrifices themselves so that their magic can revive Hunter. The gang then get up, dust themselves off, and hop through the portal after Bellos. Even Camila. Oh, uh, V stays behind though. So say goodbye to them for the rest of the video. Bye V. I like that you were voiced by Amethyst. So while all this was going on, back in the Boiling Isles, the Collector is just messing the whole place up. He's like, huh, this is fun, let's play a game. And everyone else is like, ah! Yeah, the Collector's been running around turning everyone into toy puppets to play games with, but keeps King around to be friends. Flash forward a bit to when Luce and the gang make it back to the Demon Realm and, Oh my god! Look at what the Collector's done to this place. This is a dang Lisa Frank nightmare. Where's Dippy Fresh when you need him? Jeez. But either way, they push forward and eventually find their way to their old school Hexide, where they meet a bunch of survivors and start to hatch a plan. They gotta get up there. That castle hovering above the Titan's head is called the Archives. The Collector's castle where he's storing all the people he's turned into puppets. And up in the Archives, the Collector just likes to hang out with King, who's trying desperately to rein in the Collector's destructive tendencies. But while the Collector isn't looking, King King sneaks off to this secret lair deeper in the archives where we find Ida and Lilith. Both safe, sound, and not toys. The three of them are working to learn about the Collector and find a way to eventually stop him so things can go back to normal. But King wants to be careful. The Collector, as powerful as he is, is just a kid. And it doesn't seem like he has any family left. King knows what it's like to be the last of his kind. He understands the Collector and wants to help, but also knows that he has to be stopped. Meanwhile, back at Hexide, just a whole bunch Bunch of crap's going down. Uh, breaking it down real quick. One, Luce uses memory magic to find this crazy glyph she once saw Bellos use to travel directly to the Titan's head. That'll be useful. Two, Kikimora shows up. I, I can't remember if I've mentioned her, but she's crazy and starts attacking the gang. Three, after a series of unfortunate events involving Willow getting overwhelmed and losing control of her powers, Hunter somehow develops magic powers he never had before, using them to save his friends, and most importantly, four, while hiding from Kikimora, Luce and Camila finally have a heart-to-heart -heart talk where Camila apologizes for trying to turn Luce into something she's not. And having finally realized that all she ever wanted was to be understood, Luce's palisman egg finally begins to hatch. And just in time for the rest of the gang to catch up so they can all escape to the Titan's head. And that's the last we'll see of Kiki Mora. Say bye, everyone. Bye. I never really liked you. Once everyone's safe and sound at the Titan's head, Luce's palisman fully hatches, revealing a worm on a string. Okay, no. Well, it kinda. This is String Bean. They're a snake shifter, a weird little snake thing that can turn into whatever other creature they want. It's cute. And for a brief moment, everything seems okay. That is until the Collector attacks. And wait, is that rain? What are they doing with the Collector? Ah, right. Yeah, forgot about that. So while all this was happening, Goopy Goop Bellos needed a new body to inhabit, eventually finding his way into the archives and possessing Rain Whispers, former head of the Bard Coven, rebel against Bellos, and Ida's old romantic partner. While possessing their body, Bellos starts to manipulate the Collector, telling him he's in danger, that King is going to betray him, and that Luce is back to stop him. Which, to be fair, isn't entirely wrong. It's just a little exaggerated. So right as Luce's palisman hatches and everyone feels safe for a moment, we see the Collector and Bellos spying on them. The Collector is now led to believe that everything Bellos said was the truth, so when Bellos tells the Collector to attack, he does. And with that, we're in finale territory. No going back now. And right at the start, things aren't going that great. The Collector turned Luce's friends into puppets and is using them to trap Luce, Ida, and King in waking nightmares. But when the Collector goofs up his Amity and says, I challenge you to a witch's battle, Luce is like, <laughs> um, 
actually, it's Witch's duel. <laughs> and quickly catches on to what's happening. The absolute power of Luce's friggin' dorkiness momentarily breaks the illusion so her friends can tell her how to snap out of it. So, using her light glyphs, Luce is able to wake herself up and do the same for Ida and King. And for the first time this whole season, Luce, Ida, and King are all finally back together. The reunion is short, though, as the Collector pops in to play some games with them. And by play games, I of course mean place their lives in mortal danger for his amusement. Yeah, the Collector doesn't really have a grasp on the whole concept of death and what that means to mortals. He kind of looks at everyone around him as, well, toys. So we get another montage of Luce and the gang being put through the Collector's wacky games. Their lives are in danger. Man, a lot of montages this season, huh? It's almost as if they were planning to make a lot more episodes, but for some reason weren't allowed to and had to cram a whole season's worth of story into just three episodes, but... <laughs> what are the odds of that? Anyway, while all this was going on, Bellos, still controlling Rain, flies off to their old castle with just just a real bad idea. So remember how I said the Boiling Isles is built on the corpse of a giant dead Titan? And remember how Belos' old throne room was built at the heart of the Titan? And even though it was dead, the heart was still beating? And remember how Belos can now possess whatever or whoever he wants? Yeah. Nah, it's probably nothing. Let's check back in on Luce. After trying to play with Luce, Ida, and King for a while, and them very clearly not being into it, it being the imminent threat on their lives, the Collector gets sad, and the gang is finally able to just sit down and talk to him. And here we get some long-awaited backstory on the Collector. Apparently, a... Hmm. Apparently, a long time ago, the Collector's siblings, called the Archivists, sent him down to the Boiling Isles to play with all the Titans that roam the surface. And the Collector made friends with all the little baby Titans, just like King. But the sheer power of the Titans scared the Archivists. Apparently, the only thing more powerful than a Collector's magic is a Titan. So the Archivists started wiping them out one by one, and that made the big Papa Titan real mad. But then he goofed up and blamed the Collector for what his siblings did, trapping him in that moon tablet and seeing him away for yeah, as long as it took to get to this point. So the Collector really is just a lonely kid looking to make friends, but doesn't know how. So Luce decides to teach him by showing him how she became friends with Ida, King, and the others, bringing him to multiple places across the Boiling Isles that meant a lot to her. Wait, what? what's that over there? Ah! Okay, so while Luce was teaching the Collector about kindness and forgiveness, Bellos ditched Rain's body and hopped right into the Titan's heart, now taking control of the entire Boiling Isles. That's... That, that's maybe not going to be helpful. And with the power of a Titan now at his fingertips, what's the first thing that Bellos does? Moss! Moss everywhere! Evil death-bringing moss! Bellos's moss spreads all across the Boiling Isles, consuming everything in its path, and soon forming a smaller, but still treacherously large titan itself. This mossy Bellos titan just starts spitting blue all over the place. But the Collector, having processed what Luce taught him, decides to pull a Steven Universe and just tries to hug it out. Okay, no. Luz flies in in the last second to save the Collector. But in doing so, she got hit and the infection started. Soon, it fully overtook her, disintegrated, and left Luz dead and gone. Cause of death? Moss. Obviously, this enrages Ida and King, who both go into full monster mode and attack Bellos. And the Collector starts to process that Luz is dead and what that really means. Meanwhile, Luz is fine. Well, Kinda. She is dead, but she's not gone. We see her floating through this weird interdimensional purgatory where she meets, get this, Papa Titan. Yes, King's dad. The Titan the Boiling Isles is built on and the one Bellos is currently puppeting. Also, he's voiced by Aaron Hansen from Game Grumps? This guy? Look at me! <laughs> He does a great job. Anyway, Papa Titan is like, Luce, you looked after my kid real good. As a reward, here's literally all my powers. Okay, go save the world. I'm gonna die now. Bye! <coughs> <coughs> And then Luce just shoots right back up to the surface, now reborn with crazy Titan superpowers. She saves Ida King and the Collector from Belos and flies off to the Titan's head. The Collector goes off on his own to protect everyone in the archives, having learned the error of his ways. And Luce, Ida, and King just go on a moss killing spree, helping to stop Belos' invasion of the Boiling Isles before plunging right into the heart of the Titan, saving Rain, who's been stuck in the moss this whole time, and then just ripping Belos out of the Titan's heart by hand. 
and with Bellows forced out of the Titan, he loses control, all the moss evaporates, and the Boiling Isles is saved. Hooray! But Bellos isn't done. With his plan completely foiled, this guy makes one last desperate attempt to gain control. He shapeshifts to take the form of his former self, Philip Wittebane, and lies through his teeth. He's like, oh, wow, did I do that? <laughs> That's awkward, right? Well, <laughs> it's a good thing you were here. I was actually cursed the whole time. That's, uh, that, that's right, and you freed me, and... <laughs> Yeah, no one's buying any of Bellos' crap anymore. And Luce just backs away while Bellos is pelted with acid rain and literally stomped out of existence by Ida, King, and Rain. So Bellos is dead. Luce then loses her Titan powers, the Collector helps turn everyone back to normal and return them home, and all our heroes get reunited with their families. And wait, hold on. One, two, three, four. Did no one die? Like, besides Bellos and Flapjack? Yeah. Huh, would you look at that? <laughs> Basically everyone survived. Well, dang. The Collector, knowing how much growing up he still needs to do, flies off back to the cosmos. Luce gets reunited with their friends and family. Ida and King meet Camila for the first time. The gang get reunited with Hootie, who barely had a single line this whole season. Wow. And it seems like everything's back to normal. Fast forward a few years in a classic season finale time skip, and we see Luce in the human realm packing her things for college. In the Boiling Isles? Yeah, take that, Amphibia, with your heartbreaking commentary on letting go and moving on. The Owl House actually lets Luce maintain a life in both the Human Realm and the Boiling Isles. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. And as Luce packs her things, we get a beautiful end credit montage to see what everyone's up to now. Looks like Willow's become a grudge bee pro, which is, like, a wizard sport? I, I can't remember if I mentioned it before. Hunter's carving palisman now and even got himself a new bird. Funny internet videos. Amity is... Well, I'm not 100% sure what she's doing, but she looks like she's killing it. Speaking of which, Amity's dad has been working with Rain and the former Coven heads to develop a way to remove Coven sigils as the Boiling Isles ushers in a new era of, like, freedom and peace and whatever. And then there's the brand new University of Wild Magic, where Luce is about to attend. Gus is here teaching people about the human realm, which is really cute, and Ida is the headmaster. Yes, rebellious, school-hating Ida is now the headmaster of a university. And King is taller. And everyone gets together to meet Luce and Camila as they make their way back to the Boiling Isles, and they all throw her a huge surprise party. Even the Collector shows up to throw a crazy cosmic fireworks show. Everyone then piles in for one last freeze frame to send things off, and that was the Owl House. And oh, wait, hold on, yeah. There it is. Now the denial starts. Hey, have you heard about this thing called the Amazing Digital Circus? It's this cartoon on YouTube that has absolutely blown up over the last few months. I'm talking memes, cosplays, trending TikTok sounds, fan arts, the works. And it has not slowed down a bit. So what's the deal? Well, the Amazing Digital Circus is part of the wonderful world of independent animation. An ever-growing side of the animation industry filled with intense creativity, unique ideas, long, long gaps in between uploads, uh, reliance on Patreon to offset intense production costs, and soul crushingly intense amounts of work. It's great! And The Amazing Digital Circus is a new pilot short created by the animator and musician Gooseworks and produced by Australian indie animation studio Glitch Productions. Which, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, a pilot is basically a proof of concept episode used to pitch a potential show to a network, or in this case, an audience on YouTube, to see if it's worth pursuing a full series. The first teaser for The Amazing Digital Circus was released back in January of 2023, and the full-fledged pilot dropped back on October 13th, 2023. And considering that video is currently sitting at over 220 million views. I, I, yeah, I'd say it was a pretty successful pilot. So let's talk about it. Yeah, spoilers ahead for uh, for the one episode. So this show takes place in, yeah, surprise, surprise, the amazing digital circus, which is some kind of unexplained alternate world that exists inside of a computer. Almost like a virtual reality. Hold up. And the first thing we see in the show is, oh, oh, look at that. He got teeth face. This uh, creature is Kane, the ringmaster of the digital circus whose head is teeth and his face is teeth and his eyes are in his teeth and he wears a top hat. As far as I can tell, uh, he's the boss around here. He controls everything, has the ability to more or less bend reality to his will, and is the guy that everyone else seems to report to. Oh, and then there's everyone else. You got Gangle, a little ribbon creature with one of those comedy tragedy mask things going on. There's Zubal, who's... Yeah. 
uh, that. There's this king chess piece with concerning mental issues. We have Ragatha, one of those old Raggedy Ann dolls. Jax, who you are already writing fanfic about in your head, don't lie to me. Yeah, he's a wisecracking purple version of Max from Sam and Max, and he's just kind of a dick to everyone. Then there's Kofmo, or not. And finally, we got our main character, this person. They are new to the circus, literally popping in right in the middle of the theme song. And we don't know much about them or who they were before this moment, but what we do know is that they were a person who put on a VR headset, got transported to the amazing digital circus, and can't escape. And what's worse, uh, they can't even remember their name. Uh, my name is, uh... Uh, yeah, apparently no one can remember their name when they enter the circus. So, Kane randomly generates them a new one, Pomni. And now things start to make some sense. All these wacky characters are people who also used to be just normal human beings with like jobs and tax returns until they got sucked into this digital world and now have no way to leave. They got new wacky bodies and kooky names and now they live day by day going on cartoony adventures created by Kane as a way to keep them all busy. Because if they aren't kept busy, they all just might lose their minds and abstract. Speaking of, uh, where's Kofmo again? This looks fine. This looks fine! So Kofmo abstracted, which again means he lost his mind and his digital form corrupted into this big thing covered in eyes. And he just start rampaging through the circus tent, knocking out Ragatha and making her go all glitchy. So Pomni, still not sure if any of this is even real, goes searching for Kane to get some help for Ragatha. But in doing so, she accidentally stumbles upon this exit door. Yeah, they've been seeing this thing appearing and disappearing on and off this entire time, but no one believed them when they said it was real. But this time they were actually able to get to the door before it vanished and hop through it. On the other side, though, is what looks like a normal, painfully boring office building. And every door just leads to another boring office room. And another, and another, and another, and another, and another. Pomni keeps running through every single door until they stop and see this desk with a grody old computer and a VR headset sitting on it. They just kind of stare at it for a while and then break out into hysterical laughter. Yeah, this probably means something. Maybe this is where they were originally sitting or working when they got sucked into the digital circus. And maybe they're just realizing they're going in circles. I don't know. I'm not really a theory guy. I'll leave that up to Matt Pat. Oh. Oh. Eventually, the office labyrinth ends and Pomni accidentally falls out into this infinite white void. Kane zaps in to save them and the two return to the tent. Kane then sends the abstracted Kofmo into the cellar where we see that clearly this is not the first time someone's abstracted like this. Then he snaps his fingers and fixes up Ragatha who was still all glitchy. Yeah, I forgot about that. And finally, he admits that the exit wasn't real. It's something he was working on because of how much everyone wanted an exit to exist, but he never got around to finishing it so it eventually just let out into that infinite void, which is why he kept denying it was real. Meaning Pomni really just is stuck here. The gang wrap up their day by sitting down for a digital feast. That dramatic orchestra music that you've probably heard all over TikTok starts playing. We zoom way out to see that same computer desk again. And that is the amazing digital circus. And wow, this is just an outstanding pilot. I gave you the basic rundown just now, but please do yourself a favor and watch the whole thing. When this video is done, I swear to God, if you click away, I will find you. But seriously, uh, the pilot is so worth watching if you haven't already. I didn't even get into the B-plot with this big worm thing and the gloinks, I don't know. There's just so much here to take in. The animation is bright, colorful, bouncy, fluid, fast paced, and just all around really charming. Now, I've actually been familiar with the work of the show's lead animator, Kevin Temmer, for a while now. Now they've got a pretty immediately recognizable style and bounce to their work, so I was not surprised to see they were connected to this project in such a major way. Then on top of the animation, the writing is just fantastic. I know you might look at something like this and think of things like Poppy Playtime, My Friendly Neighborhood, that bear game, and a bunch of other indie horror stuff that kind of takes a bright, colorful, family-friendly premise and turns it into a horror thing. And while there's definitely some horror elements at play here, I was surprised at just how much of a straight comedy this show was. And it's pretty much my exact style of humor. You know, fast-paced, fourth-wall-breaking meta-humor with a bit of a spooky edge has been a weakness of mine ever since I was a kid. This show would have fit perfectly between Baby Fofy's viewings of Invader Zim and the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy. But you know, it's not just the comedy. The plot of this pilot is packed with the exact 
exact right amount of creativity, surreal concepts, world building, intrigue, and like breadcrumbs to theorize about to get you immediately hooked. Just the basic setup of can Pomni even leave is enough to have me ready for a full season. So yeah, I got into this immediately and I am so excited to see where it goes. But that's the thing, at least right now, this one video is all we got. Animation takes a lot of time, especially indie animation. This stuff is time consuming and expensive. So even though that view count means we are 100% getting more amazing digital circus, I have absolutely no clue how long that wait's gonna be. But if the internet's good at anything, it's taking one cool thing and just running with it. Stretching what little material we've got for weeks and weeks and months and months until we, I don't know, get distracted. And this channel's no stranger to grasping at straws, so what's all out there for us new Amazing Digital Circus fans to enjoy while we wait for episode two? Well, luckily, Glitch Productions, Gooseworks, and some other people attached to the project have released some extra Digital Circus content. It mainly things like behind the scenes stuff, interviews, and some like supplementary mini content. The previously mentioned lead animator, Kevin Temmer, has uploaded a handful of really interesting behind the scenes videos on clips he animated for the series. So if you're an animation fan and want a little peek into the process for this show, uh, these are really cool to watch. Glitch Productions uploaded the pilot's full soundtrack on YouTube, so not only can you hear the pilot's music in full, including that viral track from the ending, but I also really like the more detailed look you can get at the pilot's background, especially this one of The Void. The art is so nice, such a good style. If you're looking for more of the show's characters though, Glitch did an ad with a bunch of the different voice actors jumping in and out of character, all to promote this big live stream that's over now. Sorry, I got I got to all this late. But the video itself is still a fun watch and showcases all the voice actors really well. And that live stream that I didn't get to watch so I can't actually talk about was hosted by another YouTuber who watches too many cartoons, Saberspark. And while I was writing this video, Saberspark uploaded their own big podcasty video interviewing the entire cast of the show. So there's that, too. And of course, there's always... We are Pudgy Jacks, Plushy. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait, they already had merch ready to sell as soon as the pilot aired? What is, what's up with that? But hold your horses, keyboard cat. Yeah, I know merch can be a bit of a divisive thing on YouTube, depending on who's peddling it, but this isn't some cynical cash grab or anything. Merch sales are an absolutely key factor to making sure large-scale independent projects like this get the funding they need to continue. If you want more amazing digital circus, they're gonna have to sell some shirts. And honestly, the stuff they're selling does look pretty cool. I don't actually have any of it, but I definitely got my eye on a couple of things. The Pomni and Jax plushies are super cute, but man, that color blocked cane shirt is calling out to me. It's saying, put me on your skin. And of course, I mention all this because one of the only other pieces of official Digital Circus video content left at the time that I'm writing this is a merch ad. And weirdly enough, I think it's maybe the closest thing to episode two that we've got so far, as silly as that might sound. Same characters, same voice actors, same writing and sense of humor, same slightly unsettling vibe, just, you know, selling merch instead of telling a story. Yeah, you can really tell I'm stretching for extra stuff to talk about, can't you? I mean, until episode two drops, that really is the majority of the amazing Digital Circus official stuff there is to talk about. But what I wanna do now is like zoom out a bit. Too far. There we go. Because while well, yes, The Amazing Digital Circus is a fantastic cartoon pilot with tons of promise for a greater series, I also think it's a great example of a larger recent trend in like YouTube history. Yeah, remember when this channel used to be about that? I kind of miss talking about YouTube history, so I want to get back to it from time to time. And in the world of YouTube animation, The Amazing Digital Circus is just the latest in a long line of independent animation projects that either exist mainly on YouTube or gain their audience through YouTube. Yeah, obviously going way back, you had animated series released by companies like Rooster Teeth, you know, stuff like Red vs. Blue and Ruby. But it feels like lately there's been a really noticeable surge of independent animated pilots and shows that are not only of amazing quality, but are also just some of the biggest things on YouTube, animated or otherwise. The first one I remember seeing pop up was uh, Bibsy Pop's pilot for Has Been Hotel back in what, 2019? It's been four years? Man, I've I really am late to this. But yeah, I remember this pilot dropping on YouTube and just absolutely taking over, along with another pilot from the same creator that dropped just the next month called Hell of a Boss. Both of these shows were huge. To this day, those initial videos have 93 million and 61 million views respectively. Hell of a Boss has been running on YouTube for multiple seasons, and Has Been Hotel has been deep in production with its first full season premiering on Amazon Prime this month, with season two apparently already greenlit. All from a start right here on YouTube. 
YouTube. Then there were shows like Worthy Kids Big Top Burger in 2020. This is one of the most surreal and hilarious cartoons I've seen online for a while, and I highly recommend the two seasons that are out. Though, because the shorts are only a couple minutes long, uh, each season's only about the length of one normal pilot episode, and just keep that in mind, but lord are these good. There's Monkey Wrench, which launched last year, and while it's not experienced the same level of viral success, it still managed to gain a following and release three episodes with the help of fan support. And that same year, there was also an astonishingly animated pilot release called Lackadaisy, which is an adaptation of a webcomic that appears to have been running since like the mid 2000s. This pilot currently sits at 12 million views and again, thanks to fan support, crowdsourced the funding for a full season. And of course, Glitch Productions themselves have been running indie animated series for like three years now on their YouTube channel. And then there's the amazing Digital Circus, which after doing a quick rundown of all those other fantastic indie pilots, I think we should really revisit that insane view count. Has Been Hotel became one of the biggest things on YouTube with less than 100 million views gained over the course of the last few years. Amazing Digital Circus has more than doubled that in just a few months. Like, don't get me wrong, this, this is not a competition. No piece of art is any more or less valid due to its view count. I only bring it up to provide extra context to just how unbelievable this is. Correct me if I'm wrong, but off the top of my head, I just can't think of any other indie animation pilots that got this big this fast. This video and the other pilots like it are by far some of the most exciting and interesting things happening in the animation world, but I don't think they get enough credit for being such a landmark in YouTube history. For years now, the prevailing idea has been that while animation could potentially thrive on YouTube, it would either be fighting an uphill battle against the YouTube algorithm or would have to undergo some intense compromises. But then here's a wealth of creators and teams putting in the work to make stuff that just seems to defy all YouTube norms. Big, flashy, beautifully animated, well-written shorts that are beyond TV quality, earning dedicated audiences ready and willing to help support these shows to continue, and all while pulling views that only people like Mr. Beast tend to see. It's crazy, it's crazy. And the amazing Digital Circus is just the latest success story continuing to solidify independent animation's place both on YouTube and in the industry at large. I truly cannot wait to see what's next. No, seriously, I, I can't wait. Normally the shows I talk about have been over for years. What am I supposed to do when I actually have to wait for more? Be patient, do other stuff? That's not how I function. Oh well, into the void for me.